So maybe I start. So good morning, uh, everyone. I hope uh, you enjoy uh, the dinner yesterday. Uh, I am very happy personally with the conference. I hope you also find it interesting and fruitful. That was my wishes uh, at the beginning. Now I have to announce that we have an exchange of chair of the session. So the first one will be uh, Nando Ferroni and then Daniela will take uh, the second session. Uh, so now I just uh, give the floor to Nando Ison. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's, that's great. Good morning, everybody. Um, so, we are in uh, the session of Detector R&D, uh, which consists of three talks. Yeah, the first one is on photosensors. So, I call uh, Mathieu Heller on... Yes, I'm there already. You're there. Sorry. I didn't... I didn't turn uh, yeah. by 90 <laughs> degrees, I'm sorry. So you have uh, a bit less than 30 minutes Thanks a lot. allowing for question. Okay, good morning everyone. Thanks a lot to the organizers for, for letting me uh, present this summary on uh, photosensors R&D. Um, so first, this was already flashed yesterday by Jan. Uh, I would like to, my, my talk obviously will not cover everything, not all topics, not all technologies, there are far too many. And that would be not so, so nice to go just flash one slide per, per technology. So I think I, I'd like to focus on what comes out of this, uh, this graph from the ECFA roadmap. Mostly I will discuss about uh, silicon photomultipliers. As you can see, these are where uh, most of the challenges for the years to come. But the good thing about photomultipliers, silicon photomultipliers in particular, is that we know that they are used uh, basically everywhere. Also a lot in medical science. I will also give you a bit what I consider to be uh, probably the, the future of this field, so electronics integration, uh, CMOS integration, as close as possible to the sensor, and also w w of the things, some of the, the things we, we may get from other fields. So vacuum-based photosensor, I, I cannot skip this for sure, and, and the very reason why I can't skip is that there is still no competitors for, uh, for PMTs and vacuum base photosensors when it comes to instrument very large surfaces. So uh, it's also very mature technology. You don't put detectors in the eyes for eternity if you're not sure that they will work quite long. So that's uh, actually here you see the, the upgrade sensors for the ice cube the Gen 2 that were already also shown yesterday by Jan. Uh, and you have all these detectors which requires uh, great surface to be covered. So here you see the, the lasso, water, chunk of telescope, uh, chunk of um, detector array, a massive uh, pool uh, for, for cosmic ray detection. Here's just a glance at uh, also what will be the um, hyperkamic and the outer detector. So PMT are not big enough. We need to add even uh, wavelength shifting tiles to increase the size. But that's again showing that, uh, that there is no alternative there. There is still for sure research R&D. Uh, mostly incremental, I would say, uh, improving quantum efficiency, transit time spread, especially when you go to, to such large sizes. The second uh, vacuum for base for the sensors I would like to mention is, is microchannel plate. This is also still very, very, uh, pretty much used and, and very interesting when it comes to timing, especially for, for large size. Uh, for instance, this is one example of use. Uh, this is planned for the, the upgrade of the LHCB electromagnetic carry meter. These are this, uh, this large area pico second photosensors, 20 by 20 centimeters square, and you achieve, uh, this is a result from recent test beam, uh, I mean the requirements, so better than 20 picosecond uh, above 5 GeV, so that's very interesting. Um, but they're not only good for timing, it's also very nice, uh, and they make a very nice, uh, let's say, photo electron multiplier that can be used in other det the detectors. It's for sure for MCP PMT, like the, the lasso one, the 20 inch PMT, um, but also using the, the time peaks camera that you know that you probably know as well. That is used in that case in the Ariadne TPC. Uh, coming to TPC, that brings me to uh, use of silicon PM uh, in cryogenic environments. So you know, this was also shown yesterday. Uh, this is a dual phase liquid argon or liquid xenon a time projection chamber. And here you're interested in, in detecting these two signal, uh, luminescence and, and uh, electroluminescence and scintillation signals. And the, the amplitude uh, of the two tells you what type of particle you, you, you detected. And this is obviously very useful for a rare event detection. Uh, and there, clearly, this had been the uh, very dominant field for, from TMT so far. 
Main reason is their excellent detection and uh, quantum efficiency in, in a VUV, and also very low DCR. But silicon PM here uh, also represents very nice uh, features, especially the, the low radioactivity per area, which is very uh, wished for this type of experiments. They have for sure not as good quantum efficiency in VUV, but they're they clearly also better in the visible. So if you shift the wavelengths, you, you come that, and potentially better in after pulsings, and for sure better in stability over time. So just a few, few experiments that are considering to make this, this step to go for, for silicon filter multipliers. So there is dark size, uh, dark side 20K. These are already well advanced R&D there. You see the, the, the modules. Uh, you also have a Zurich uh, 2 TPC where you, they're planning to use the, this um, VUV4. So the, the, this is, if you, if you know, uh, potentially the, the MEG2 um, photo multipliers from Amamatsu. This is exactly those actually. And there are several developments, uh, especially also for Darwin, where there is still uh, R&D phase uh, in this domain. They're also considering alternatives with the, the Abalone, which is, if you follow photosensors is quite an old design, but uh, it's still coming back. And I, as I was mentioning, other uh, approaches are to, to shift the wavelengths of this, uh, this VUV photons to more visible, either by coating the wall of the detector or by employing uh, wavelength shintifiers. So then a few words about how silicon PM are actually performing in uh, cryogenic environments. So here you see the, the obviously dark and straight at room temperature for CyPM is a killer. You, you have to reach below Hertz uh, per millimeter square. And this you reach at, at very low temperature. Here you see Yamamatsu uh, VUV4 and FBK here near UV uh, HD sensor. There are two types. Uh, actually, FBK did some, uh, some R&D there. You can see that they, by decreasing the, the peak field, uh, you manage to even decrease uh, by two order of magnitudes even the, the dark on traits at, uh, at very low temperature. As I said, quantum efficiency, photodetection efficiency is not yet there and probably will, will not be for, for standard silicon PM. You see that this Amamatsu reached about more than 20%, FBK about 15%, this, this version. Uh, so it's still, still not really uh, at the level of quantum efficiency of a PMT that can reach 30 or even more percent. After pulses, so this is something that probably uh, was not expected at first, but you see that when you go down in temperature, uh, after pulses increases and, and by a lot, really a lot. So uh, this is mostly due to a longer emission time constant. The hypothesis is that when you're at room temperature, uh, the, the, let's say the, the carrier uh, move and they recombine faster, so you are emitting faster, and the chance that this is done while the cell is not reached out at all, so you have no gain, makes that you see less after pulses, and this is why you see nearly uh, zero after pulses there. Uh, this is actually, I'm not showing that, but this is competing with the fact that uh, polysilicon quenching resistors increase at, uh, at low temperature, which means that you have longer uh, recovery time as well, so they're also fighting this whether it's Amamatsu or FBK and also others. And yes, actually to fight this, FBK also developed just slightly modified the low field version to, to really, again, uh, kill the after pulses. So this is now, uh, again, becoming very, uh, very interesting sensors. Radiation hardness, it's really one of the, the main topic and main, uh, let's say, R&D field for, for silicon PM. So mostly two type, uh, two type of damage, uh, bulk damage. So the displacement damage in the crystal, you build up effects, uh, defects are in the, in, the, in the crystal, which means you are adding acceptors and donors level. And that for sure end up in increasing your, your dark and rate or after pulses rate. And that's killing eventually your, your, signal, your single photoelectron resolution, which is one of the wanted feature of the, of the silicon PM. The other is the, the surface damage here. You are mostly accumulating some, some charge at the surface of the, the silicon PM. This distorts the field, change your breakdown voltage, and eventually also increase a lot the, the surface current. So this is what you observe here for uh, ionizing um, energy losses. You see for, for X-rays in that case, uh, you see really large increase uh, in, in dark on traits uh, for, for, sorry, for doses above uh, basically one megagray. Uh, when it comes to, uh, to proton, Irradiation, you again see this is one, uh, okay, I'm not trying, this is the um, near UV uh, FBK sensor. And here you see that clearly this is the IV, reverse IV curve for the, uh, the, the sensor that again, the dark on trade even uh, at rest, let's say below breakdown, increase a lot. So eventually 
again, to, to summarize, radiation, hot, uh, radiation damage in silicon brings you uh, a lot of dark concentrate and that eventually affects your, your single photoelectron resolution. And because at some point you get such a high dark concentrate, you also get some self-heating. So there is such a large current drawing that self-heating will, uh, will induce the, the shift of the breakdown voltage and eventually reduce your, your photo detection efficiency gain and so on. You can see that illustrated here for fluences uh, greater than 10 to the 12 uh, neutron equivalent per centimeter square. This is how it looks uh, before irradiation with one photoelectron and how it looks with 100 photoelectrons. This basically shows you that uh, at 5, uh, 10 to the 13. So the, the more or less the same signal to noise ratio uh, is obtained with a factor 100 more in terms of uh, light input. So if you look at, at this picture, this is indeed the, we are flashing uh, LED uh, onto the sensor and, and uh, while you're radiating and you see this kind of a threshold effect. At some point you really simply cannot uh, see any more the light and cannot distinguish uh, photoelectron. If you would compensate by increasing breakdown voltage, dark contract will again explode and then again your sensor is, is un unusable. You see that this gets better if microcell uh, decreases, uh, so that's, that's one take, clearly. Uh, but we know problems of small microcell, uh, you have lower field factor, so photo, de photo detection efficiency decreases, so this you have to pay. Also clearly, from, uh, you see from uh, neutron irradiated um, samples here, that we know in silicon that the, the, these defects are located. You see here before radiation and after uh, the, the scale is, is not the same color scale here, but the number of defects and uh, which are very localized uh, is great. I will come back to this, but you can also already foresee that having the possibility to, to control single microcell might be an option there to fight this. Annealing, that, that works and that's very, very useful, let's say. Uh, auto recovery of the performance, to be clear. and. Uh, here you see uh, at root temperature, so this is the, the IV curve again before irradiation, uh, after irradiation, and after being thermally annealed. And this is when you operate the sensor at room temperature and when you operate it to cryogenic temperatures. Clearly, when you go to cryogenic temperature, this, this, uh, this increase in dark concentrate is, is negligible, and, and you can see that here. What is interesting is that, as we know for the silicon detectors, uh, if you increase temperature during this annealing period, you recover much faster. This is about five days here, and you see that in five days, you basically are, are just uh, you recover mostly for, from the, the the irradiation. I just want to to stress that this annealing is not always easy to 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 get. So for for like uh, collider experiments, when you have no beam, that's the right time. When you are in space, you don't control that. So actually, one of the um, one of the idea of, for for the polar two detector, for instance, is to invert the Peltier cooling elements to increase the temperature and do that once per year. Ambient light, this is still also what I would consider as harsh environment and this is mostly uh, what I do and this is the imaging atmospheric telescope. So this is a domain where, uh, where for, again, for mostly due to the quantum efficiency, the, the photomultipliers were used quite uh, wide, uh, sorry, uh, widely. You see four of the main uh, cameras. This is really new one operating now the, the large size telescope uh, prototype at La Palma. And this is one of the precursors that use silicon PM. They actually demonstrate very good performance. I will come to that in the next slide. And it is why uh, for CTA there were many more, and I'm still missing some actually. There, there, there are others that are planning, so Taiga and also Lasso uh, fluorescence telescopes are using silicon PM. So there is massive move to do this, but it, it comes with a, with a price. First, what are the advantage like for, I mean, it's the same advantage of silicon PM over PMT in, in many fields. It's, it's more robust. It's much less sensitive to, uh, to, to, uh, to bright light. And one of the main demonstration of that was that uh, with the FACT telescope, they could point directly to the moon and still observe gamma ray or extensive uh, air showers at the same time. And they actually did not have to really uh, turn off the, the, the silicon photomultiplier. Uh, the high voltage, they just had to lower it down, and obviously there's no damage whatsoever. So that makes that you can basically operate uh, your telescope and your camera over a really large, uh, um, let's say, ambient light level. This is here the trigger rate as function of, of threshold. This curve here is the, your, basically when you increase the threshold, you start to decrease the number of events which are triggered only by accidentals, nice, what we call night sky background, and here the flat part is, is the proton curve. So. This is, this is how a uh, nice sky background is forcing you to increase your threshold and eventually 
uh, decrease your, your energy threshold. Why it's not so easy to use uh, silicon PM for, for gamma ray astronomy is mostly because of the highest density in, in the infrared. In purple here, you see the Cherenkov uh, spectrum, mostly picked around 320. And, and in uh, light gray here, you see the NASCA background spectrum, which mostly expands uh, and really hurts, let's say, above 550 nanometer. So you see, th that's the main reason why PMTs are a very, very good match, right? They have excellence and, and really well uh, matching quantum efficiency uh, with respect to the, the Cherenkov spectrum at this altitude. Uh, here you see the integrated uh, sorry, efficiency and you see that you are integrating very low noise and basically above 700 you are insensitive and you don't see anything. While for, for silicon photomultipliers you still continue to integrate signal, right? But you'll still also integrate a lot of this NASCAR background. And if you integrate NASCAR background, we saw it there, you are pushing your threshold away. So. Here, the, the, the way to go, one way is obviously to develop uh, filters, but filters affect your, your overall efficiency as well. Uh, and you can see that if you put a filter with a cutoff here, you are losing also all of this. Uh, so pushing the, the, the quantum efficiency, the photo detection efficiency to, to more UV, it's, uh, it's, it's the big deal here. And, uh, and FBK does that since long, uh, very well actually. And recently, also, uh, we actually at the University of Geneva were in contact with Amamatsu and really pushed them to, to develop and, and change one of their technology to make it uh, more UV enhanced. And in very short time, they managed to improve uh, remarkably uh, by more than a factor two at 300 nanometer, the, the quantum efficiency. And also make actually very, very short pulses, which is how you fight pileup. Yesterday, there was one, uh, one question about how to, to build and think the future detectors, uh, being aware of what future um, analysis technique can provide. So I think this is what we're also trying to do here for the, the, the potential upgrade, uh, or at least proposal upgrade for the large size camera featuring for silicon photomultipliers. This is uh, one tera electron volt proton event here. Uh, and simulation. On the left, you have this, the, the classical, let's say, the, the, the current LST camera featuring a silicon PM of 0.1 degree field of view each. And you can see a rather big blob. And, and if you go to 0.05 degree and silicon PM, you can already start to resolve much more features in the image. And you could definitely, in that image, extract much more information. You could label here there is a muon, here there is a sub, sub shower, let's say so. Uh, th that's the point, right? Uh, building detectors that in the future will be able to deliver much more. Electronics integration. So here it's bringing CMOS capability, CMOS circuitry uh, really close to the sensor. Uh, why it's interesting, you can have uh, active quenching that's really good for timing, also really good for after pulses, you recharge uh, after a given time. Uh, and also single microcell uh, control access, what I was mentioning. You have several ways to do that. Uh, so first, front side illumination, which is, let's say, what, how classical silicon PM are operated. Problem is you, bring, you need to bring the signal, the inert signal, to the back and put the readout sensor. So that will cost you eventually because you have to put uh, through silicon vias so that affects your field factor. If you do that, obviously, on top, kind of 2D approach, you're losing a lot in field factors. Um, so the, 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 most, the ideal way is to uh, do some what we call backside illumination, BSI. Uh, you flip uh, the, the silicon PM and you, then you can directly connect the anode to the, to the readout chip. So that's, yeah, as it's written, 100% field factor, you don't lose anything. Uh, TSV free, but we know very well that the, the, sorry, the UV photons will be absorbed very, very early. So you lose almost completely the UV sensitivity, you can see that. Here, they are obviously making progress. You can see that in three years, uh, you are seeing here, uh, let's say, the, 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 this part of the, the sensor. You are also increasing the, the depletion region such that the photons reach much uh, easier, much more easily, sorry, the, the multiplication region. And all that is also supported by, let's say, all the, the this goes along, the, um, the progress in this field. With, uh, with also an uh, increase in technology for, for uh, bonding and, and so on. So you have much more interconnection uh, per unit space, and that means also you can actually lower the pixel size again. Clearly here, there is still some room to improve towards uh, near UV UV. So this is uh, still ongoing. Coming back to front side illumination, 
uh, as I said, either you go 2D and then you have compromise between how much intelligence, how much CMOS you want to put on the chip on the front side and how much sensitive you want to be, or you go 3D. And 3D, we know, it's complex, expensive, but the uh, good thing is that many, many uh, fields are interested in this, so we are not the main driver here. We are benefiting for, from many other fields to, to develop that. Uh, still there, you need to, to do that with, uh, with very good, um, uh, let's say, uh, through silicon via density, and this is what, what also FBK has been uh, very good at, so really decreasing, uh, for instance, the, the, the trenches between the microcell to, to decrease the, the, the space loss and uh, increasing the, the, decreasing the TSV size. You can always recover partially the, the photodetection efficiency using micro lenses. This was kind of a dream in the past. This is now becoming much more used. Uh, you have here some examples um, from, uh, from Leti. This works actually very well. They are investigating different, uh, different structures. Uh, this is also quite appealing if you want to recover performance losses. This is what uh, Sci-Fi for LHCB is considering. It's very hard to exchange the, the silicon PM, if not impossible, uh, in this module. So one idea is to simply coat, simply to coat and add this micro lens, and you can already recover 15% in PDE. That allows you to reduce the breakdown voltage to uh, to bring you back to a DCR level, the data contract level, which is acceptable. And, and still get the, the, the same uh, photo detection efficiency. One very concrete example of this is what has been uh, digital silicon PM that are developed for the Darwin uh, dual, um, dual phase uh, TPC. So these are concrete sensors uh, that already uh, demonstrated very good performance in terms of, uh, of uh, dark constraint, especially at cryogenic temperature, and, and also very, very low power per, per photon uh, rate. So this is how it's uh, why it's super, super useful is that you, complete, you reduce a lot the need of uh, all the readout chain uh, in the back. So material, uh, you, you gain a lot and, and eventually that's very good for radio purity. Just to conclude, my vision, let's say, or not, not only mine, but uh, a lot, so bringing AI very close to the sensor. There was brilliant talk from, uh, from Farah in an ECFA roadmap meeting. I invite you to, to look at that. So it's clear. You, we, we know our sensor more and more, we know the, the physics more and more, and, and therefore we can try to push this intelligence really close to the sensor, and that has obviously direct impact on data throughputs, uh, data storage, and so on. So this is, it has repercussion all along the, the DAQ chain. Um, so this is very appealing for online reconstruction, data volume reduction, with, for instance, uh, variational autoencoders, where you really can represent your data in, in a latent space, which is much, much smaller, store this and then decode with, with the, the decoder part. And, and obviously for, for triggering, as this is already planned for the electro high granularity um, galerimeter, you have to choose the right hardware. This is not uh, so obvious. This really depends on your need and, and uh, the complexity of your algorithms and, and the need. I, m my favorite would go towards uh, neuromorphic ASICs, which, uh, which especially I would say where we have to do some some work is uh, using analog uh, neuromorphic ASIC, which are pretty slow because not developed at all for our field, rather for, for bio neurology. Uh, the, so they are like microsecond sensitive, but if you bring that to nanosecond, you can attach that. I mean, this is work, this is called spiking neural networks. So the, the impulse, what drives the, the network is an impulse. And this is exactly what our photo sensors are delivering to us. So if you manage to already bring some high level reconstruction really close to the sensor, you can throw away part of the the, the, the data processing. And going even further, this is what uh, this is really, really very recent. Uh, this is using a memory source uh, crossbar arrays. There, there you see already, you could have your photosensors and connect it. What they are choosing to do is directly actually have the photosensors on top of this memory uh, crossbar arrays. And then by using some, uh, I mean, this, this uh, sorry, this pixel, each pixel is basically four pixels and you have some multiply and accumulation um, techniques. So that means this is mostly used for uh, computer vision and, and uh, autonomous driving. Obviously, this is a driving field, so it's not meant for low light level, uh, probably not radar and so on. But this is what also can, can bring some, some novelty in the future. And just to close, uh, this is also another level of uh, going closer to the sensor. We don't put any sensor at first before doing any reconstruction. We use directly the light. Obviously, in that case, it's again not directly applicable. Here, if you need Korean light, rather a high light level, but you are implementing a diffractive neural network. So you're actually 
uh, training these uh, these layers to 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 perform the right interferences uh, at each layer to extract the pattern uh, that was in the inputs and and then you can actually 3d print these this uh, these optical layers and just extract the information you want you could think of a, of a, of a digital cypm array here that would just be linearly graded for energy for position and then you have a camera that directly returns a high level information I think I'm not, sure, I'm not sure about the timing. Do I still have time for? Okay, uh, excellent. So prospects, I think uh, we still have uh, clearly PMTs and vacuum-based photosensors really have uh, still some great future, especially uh, as I said, when it comes to cover large areas. So silicon PM are, are catching up, but usually it's by coupling them to uh, wavelength shifting materials, scintillators, and usually you lose uh, a bit in timing performance. I think there is still quite uh, there is still quite some room for improvement, but we are very close to, to being able to to efficiently use a, a silicon PM for for VUV application. For I would say the big the big uh, the R and D has to do with the radiation hard uh, studies for for silicon PM. Most of the things are we observe them. We are not yet explaining all of them, and it's not clear what we can do. Uh, inherently, CyPM are not really radar, there, and you have to, to deal with that. So I also think there was a, I put the, the link in the slides, there was a workshop recently at CERN. Uh, what came out of this workshop is uh, you need more uh, standard uh, for, for results comparison. It's very hard to compare how it's, uh, such as, I mean, one sample, one CyPM was irradiated and, and what's, what's the conclusion about that. So, and I, I would repeat my, let's say my, my take is that I think we have to, to improve and to, uh, to continue working on, a, on a, elect a readout integration to the sensors. We know that there is a lot to do to improve the, the SPAD, so the, the single photoelectron uh, avalanche diode quality, especially in CMOS processes. But that also means working closer to, to actually uh, silicon PM providers. And more and more you see projects, European projects, where the CMOS experts work directly with, uh, for instance, Sensor, FBK, and so on, and try to, to really bring the best of the two fields. And we stop here. Yeah. Thanks a lot. It's time for questions. Yes. Hi. Just to add on, on our previous discussion, I mean, if you really want to have this um, front and near processing of, of pixels, for instance, of your silicon photomultiplier. I mean, we, uh, you yeah. would need to address, so to say, all the single pixels in, for instance, the silicon PM, and you have shown the example that this has some drawbacks. Uh, could you comment a bit on the option to have, uh, for instance, smaller feed holes and so on? Yeah. So it, you have to also be careful about how much uh, electronic, let's say, you put that, that eventually consumes heat, costs a lot. Um, Single microcell access, especially for readout, like if you want to have one TDC per microcell, that will consume a lot. So there are some, some projects, some ASICs, uh, for instance, FastIC uh, that was developed for Attract, where you try to do that cleverly and, and you use this so-called uh, H3 structure where you try to have equal routing between microcells to, to, to maintain the, the timing performance. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's again some compromise. You, you really, I think single microcell access is, is still maybe not the way to go. I would say group of microcells probably. Where would you see then the, 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 the AI in your uh, applications? Because uh, essentially so you need to, to address the information. That you yeah, yeah, this is again, this is, uh, you, you need, yeah, you, you probably, again, I don't see that as necessarily at a single microcell, uh, especially when we come to... Well, groups to, of them. I mean, yeah, groups clear. of them. But, well, that's then... Uh, it will take uh, really a lot of time, actually, to, uh, to convince, uh, because these are fields that yet not connect uh, very well, I would say. And these sensors now are driving by, by computer vision. Uh, for sure, this will improve, but... Um, Uh, sorry, <coughs> let me disagree a bit on the conclusion because you said that there is a lot of work to do on the silicon PM. I think it's a very strong uh, statement. There is, lot, there is some work to do, obviously, because we have to improve. We, we always need more, but silicon PMs are, are there. Even yeah. 
yeah. and actually are taking over already. Even the comparison that you showed, uh, for example, because you mentioned precisely the wavelength shifter, yep. I think the comparison that you showed uh, about silicon PM and PMTs, uh, I think this is a specific wavelength. Uh, yes, correct. At, at uh, xenon uh, scintillation. In the in, um, far uh, uh, vacuum ultraviolet, actually it's the other way around, because you have some sensitivity, for instance, for the argon scintillation at 128, you have some sensitivity of the silicon PM. Those mm -hmm. silicon PM are still sensitive there, but they, as far as I know, there is no PM, for example, that works in liquid, uh, sorry, in cold, uh, without wavelength shifter. Mm -hmm. So at that wavelength, it's actually the other way around. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the comment. Um, uh, <laughs> I was wondering about, I have memory of uh, um, uh, limited uniformity um, among the different uh, CPM sensors. Uh, uh, is still uh, an issue, the uniformity of different devices? I have two questions. This is one, in particular when you assembled in, in the grid in, or in the camera of a Cherenkov telescope. Um, uh, okay, if you can answer yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would say on, on uh, what I observed from my experience from one even in the same technology, same manufacturer from one production batch to another, you may have quite large variations. If you look at data sheets from Amamatsu, for instance, the range for crosstalk is quite large. You can go from 5% uh, to nearly 10%. And for instance, in our camera, first was 5% and the second batch was 10%. Then on one production batch, uniformity is, is really good. I mean, especially, okay. I, would, I would say what I know, Amamatsu mostly is excellent. Okay, then a quick question. Can you tell us which progresses we have uh, accumulated in the last 10 years uh, producing silicon PM, not in Japan, but elsewhere, like uh, in Trento or other places? Which, which progresses? In, yeah, yeah Did, well, do we achieve any progress in yes. developing uh, CPM in the last uh, 10 or 12 years? Yeah, yeah, sure. So first, if you look 10 years ago, you would have only basically a uh, uh, RGB, so visible uh, for silicon photomultipliers. Now you go from VUV to, to near infrared. Uh, we improved a lot also uh, availability for, let's say, uh, in processes for different microcell size. That gives you a lot also of freedom for, for dynamic range. Properties of silicon PM have improved a lot. Dark and uh, after pulses, crosstalk. The question was about ah, sorry. Uh, out not in Japan. I mean, progress is done yeah, not in is, Japan. Yeah, this is valid for, for FBK as well. I mean, and for Sensel and for uh, also actually, if you look, one of the driver of digital silicon PM was Philips and not uh, Hamamatsu. And this has, yeah, this has opened, uh, opened the door to many more. Um, you had in one of your transparency, you had some uh, comments about uh, the integration with the BAM bonding. Yes. How, how common are these uh, less than, uh, I forgot. 10 microns. Yeah. Well, they're very common, in, in, not in uh, photosensors, but in, uh, in memory or FPGAs and so on. This is really... Are they very expensive? Yes. <laughs> of course. That's clear. That the same comment was made yesterday. Going from, yeah, 65, uh, yeah. yeah. I think... We have to thank again, Mathieu, for this very inspiring talk. And uh, we move uh, to uh, solid state devices. The talk will be given by Giulio Pellegrini. Okay, so thank you. Let them give me, uh, <coughs> thanks to the organizer for inviting me uh, to give this talk. Uh, I will try to report on the solid state device and uh, on the work that was done in the um, ECFA roadmap on, the, on the Task Force 3 dedicated to solid state detectors. Uh, so, as you know, uh, semiconductor detectors are everywhere in all their flavors. So, uh, they're used in nuclear physics uh, for uh, um, energy measurements, in particle physics for uh, tracking, satellites. Uh, again, it's tracking in um, different forms for uh, Compton uh, uh, scattering on per production. Of course, they are also used in uh, medical application, uh, not only for uh, uh, imaging, like um, speech rear, like the Medipix collaboration, also for dosimetry. Uh, but if we look, if we look at uh, high energy physics, uh, we see that there was really 
Triumph of silicon. So silicon is everywhere in most of the experiments, not only at CERN, like Atlas, uh, CMS, or LHCB, in the uh, United States at Evatron, or in Japan for Bell 2. And the uh, trend for the next year is that the, um, the use of silicon will increase. I mean, the area that will be used for uh, next experiments, uh, it's growing uh, uh, year after year. Uh, so all these, um, uh, I mean, to get to these very high quality detectors, of course, there was a long, a large amount of R&D. And of course, uh, more difficult challenges are to be faced, which is uh, the topic or, uh, of my talk. Uh, I mean, in the, next, in the last years, we have seen that there was, um, I mean, a virtual uh, spiral between physics and detectors. So the physics experiments, they have been updating the requirements and of course detector have to follow and uh, I mean, uh, change and uh, enable this uh, uh, new physics that was uh, foreseen in the experiments. Uh, I mean, we have seen that every 10 years, the, the area of the, of the experiments has increased by factor 10. And of course also the number of channels increased by factor 100. Uh, this not only happens to the surface, but also to other parameters like radiation hardness. Uh, and there is a very nice paper from Phil Alport, this is a nature review, that explains a little bit this history from the early 80s to now, which is uh, like uh, 40 years now. And of course, there is the trend to use more and more silicon detectors in calorimetry and time of flight, <coughs> which is something a little bit new. Uh, so, I will not explain all the future detectors that have been uh, planified. These have already been explained in many talks at this symposium. Uh, but for me, what is important to extrapolate from all the talks is that there is a common message that if we want to do all these new experiments and uh, these new physics, we need to have an uh, R&D on detector which is really essential <coughs> for the next years. Uh, so, looking at the past, uh, how this was done? Well, I think the, the R&D on, uh, especially on radiation hardness on uh, silicon, started uh, in the early 80s with uh, the super uh, collider that was never built in the United States. And uh, the first paper that I found are from a Japanese group work looking at the damage and, uh, of silicon, silicon detector. Then, of course, uh, CERN, came up and there was a, there was a lot of R&D uh, done at CERN from the from starting of the 80s. Uh, there have been, I mean, there is a, this, uh, so my work started in RTV50, so uh, from uh, the early 2003 to, uh, and these are these, uh, CERN organized the work in uh, uh, technology oriented uh, collaborations. So each one is dedicated to different um, uh, tasks. So, for example, RT53 works on uh, uh, developing uh, red out electro pixel red out electronics. Uh, as I said, RD50 works on uh, um, semiconductor detectors, RD42 on uh, diamonds. Uh, so, these are, for me, my opinion, a very good example of collaboration. They are not supported uh, with money by CERN, they are supported by national fundings, but CERN gives infrastructure, uh, we have access to radiation and uh, and they give, of course, all the organization support. Uh, more recently, we have the United States, this is NOMAS uh, initiative that is very similar to the ECFA roadmap uh, in Europe. There have been in the years also uh, European projects, like uh, the last one is Aida Nova, but there have been uh, others uh, before. And uh, well, the conclusion that we can get, for example, for uh, the roadmap, also for the SNOMAS uh, um, initiative, is that the detector uh, readiness should not be the determining factor for the future particle cordiality. So we need to be ready for the future experiment. The, detector must, the, te te the technology of the detector must be ready. Uh, ah, okay. So this is where the, um, so I'm reporting here the conclusion of the, of the task force three uh, on, uh, on solid state detectors. Um, so uh, these are the, the, the R&D that have been identified. Um, I, will, I will concentrate on the first three. The last one is on the interconnection, which is also very important, but for me was a little bit out of the scopus of this talk. 
Uh, these are the people that were involved in the, in the writing of the documents, and of course there are many more that uh, helped. Uh, so uh, the, the three um, uh, points that were identified, identified are the, uh, to achieve a full integration uh, between sensing and microelectronics uh, in monolithic CMOS, uh, developing of our 4D capability uh, for the tracking, for uh, tracking and calorimetry, and of course to extend the, the use of solid state detector to extreme affluence. And I will explain what this means uh, in the next slide. So going to integration, uh, we want to have a sensing of, of uh, detectors and the redoubt electronics on the same uh, wafer. This is no new, I mean, there are uh, monolithic pixel, but the idea uh, that uh, arise, I think this is the first paper from 2007 uh, from uh, Ivan Peric, Peric uh, is that to include the drift field in the monolithic pixel. Of course, an electric field helps a lot to the collection of the charges because uh, uh, they will move by drift, uh, so in a high electric field, and not by diffusion. So this will uh, improve, uh, uh, well, it will reduce trapping, when, uh, especially when we work with the radiation, with radiation damage, uh, will make the detector faster. And uh, of course, this was uh, 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 obtained, uh, adding a deep well that isolates the electronics from the, the, the active uh, substrate. Uh, normally, well, they have different names. They are called sometimes HVC MOS because, of course, you want to work in a technology that can withstand high voltage. So high voltage means uh, 100 volts. Uh, standard CMOS works at 1 or 2 volts, depending on the technology. Uh, and depends on, depending on the technology, I mean, the technology means the foundry, in this case, uh, you can have different improvements of different designs. <clears throat> so you have some flexibility or no. Uh, these detectors have already been used in some uh, uh, experiments. The first one um, uh, was uh, the Mimosa 28 uh, chip in STAR, uh, and the last uh, installation was in ALICE uh, with the 10 square meters of, uh, based on the Terra Tower JS uh, 1 nanometer technology, and the now is working in LHC. So for the near future, uh, there is an upgrade of ALICE. They are doing a very nice work, so you can see uh, the idea is to use a, a thin substrate, so in the order of 20, 40 micron, with the, which allow airflow cooling. A and when you go to this thickness, silicon starts to be uh, flexible. So you can do detectors that can uh, follow uh, the, well, the curvature of your uh, uh, structure. Uh, they want to go to uh, deeper submicron technologies from 80, 180 of, this, uh, of the actual one to 65 nanometers, of course, this is more expensive, uh, but this allows also to use large wafers. So they go from 200 millimeters to 300 millimeters. And the big uh, improvement also is that they, can, they want to do uh, detector on the wafer scale. So one wafer can be a detector, which is very, very large uh, achievement. I mean, this is a very large detector. Compared to standard, for example, micro strip that are on the order of 10 by 10 mm, centimeters square. Uh, of course, they will have very low mass because they are uh, thin. They don't, of course, they will reduce uh, cooling, so this will uh, save a lot of mass. And at the moment, uh, they are uh, well. They have successful uh, uh, testing uh, and test beam. So uh, there are a lot of, of course, we are interested in this paper that explain a lot of this uh, technology. Okay. So the um, the other problem of uh, uh, of uh, maps. Um, is the radiation hardness. So again, uh, by changing implants, uh, we can improve the radiation hardness of this technology. At the moment, they are qualified, let's say qualified, they, they can work up to 10 times 10 to the 15 uh, neutron equivalent per centimeter square. Um, they've been used in uh, non-linear energy physics. Now there is, there is a first, at least what I found is the first application in space from this uh, Chinese uh, um, uh, satellite. Uh, in collaboration with the INFN. There are uh, European projects on, uh, on uh, computer tomography for uh, imaging. And uh, the, the recent works on, uh, on maps is, I mean, there is this uh, trade-off between larger collection electrodes, uh, because if you want to improve the field factor uh, and works at high uh, radiation fluence, but you pay the capacitance, so more noise, or to work with small uh, electrodes, so better uh, spatial resolution, but, um, but of course you can pay in, uh, in the field factor. 
it's also possible um, uh, to put some uh, gain in this detector. So going to 4D, uh, what, what do we mean for 4D tracking? Well, for 4D tracking, we mean the process to assigning a space and time coordinate to a heat. So this is something uh, new, at least for uh, the, the tracking detectors in uh, high energy physics. Uh, this is very important to suppress the pile up for the future, the, the actual upgrade, and but also for the future detectors. Um, this can bring to new ideas for new detectors or for new physics. Uh, but we don't have to forget that when we want to have timing, uh, we need to look at the sensor, the ASIC at the same time. I mean, this is, uh, uh, is the same system, and most of the time ASIC is what limits our timing performance. So for the first upgrade that will happen in the next year, for example, in Atlas MS, the idea is to include one timing later, layer um, in the forward regions. But for the future, the, the, what we want is to have all the layers to include a spatial and a timing resolution. So to have 4D tracking in all the, um, in all the layers. <clears throat> uh, of course, increasing the number of layers will increase your, uh, your timing performance. Okay, so this was possible. So why was no use it before timing in a spectrum? This was possible by uh, design innovation. Well, uh, uh, normally, um, this was an idea on uh, what's called low gain avalanche diode. So it's, uh, it's uh, based on APD. So if you look at the cross section, it's very similar. But the main difference is that uh, this detector have a gain, but it's a, it's a linear gain, more, very moderate between 10 and 30. Uh, so you don't want to work in uh, Geiger mode. Um, and the, this gain uh, operates in a very large range, where large range of uh, voltages means hundreds of volts. So we can uh, bias the detector uh, at, I mean, at hundreds of volts, uh, while normally in APD, the, the, um, uh, the, the Giger mode starts in a few millivolts of difference. Uh, when we go to know, so how we know, how we can have a good Detect, I mean, detect with a good timing. Well, we'll have to look at the noise contribution. Normally, jitter is the main contribution. Uh, this depends in a very simple way from the rise time, so the, how the signal pickups, um, how fast is the signal, uh, and from the signal to noise. So if we want to have a fast detector, we need to have a detector that is, um, uh, that is uh, this um, uh, is low rate, so the, uh, the increase of the signal is very fast. So we can use a thin detector to get that, but we need to have a high signal to noise. So in this, in this case, we need a detector with the gain. Uh, of course, there are other contributions like uh, uh, the TDC, but this is more related to the electronics, and that this can be a problem for small pixel because if we want to include uh, a TDC in every uh, pixel start to be complicated, depends on the technology used for the design or the node. Uh, the power consumption electronic can uh, increase quite a lot. Uh, and of course, the time walk, which is related to the, where the, the you reach your threshold. But this can be corrected by uh, time over threshold uh, methods, like uh, constant fractional discriminator. So the idea is to have a thin detectors uh, with the gain, and in, in, in this way, uh, we can have a detector with tens of picoseconds of time resolutions and combine it with the tens of micron of pulsar resolution. So in what we normally call pixel detector. Um, so this is uh, just, just an example as an idea that started in 2013 uh, that was developed in, uh, in, uh, in Spain, in the CNN, uh, but in the framework of RD50, so uh, the idea came here, but there was a lot of work from all the people involved in R50 to, um, I mean, to, to explore this idea for uh, these applications. And then over the years, uh, well, uh, there were other labs, like for example, FedBG in Trento, that is now uh, mastering this technology. Companies like Amamatsu, of course, they have a lot of experience in silicon photomultipliers, so for them it was very easy. To, the, to fabricate these detectors, but now there are other companies like uh, uh, Micron in UK, Teledyne, uh, and the uh, Chinese Institute. So uh, to go from the idea to real experiments, well, we have a first uh, use in Totem uh, CTPVS, but this was a very small prototype, it was like a proof of concept, I think it was in 2017. Uh, but 
the few experiments like Atlas and uh, CMS that will uh, uh, include this technology in the experiment in 2024 or 2025, depends on the delays. So we have a, a time uh, from idea to real use of 10, 11 years, which is more or less what we expect from uh, uh, detector R&D. Uh, of course, in these slides, well, I try to summarize all the possible um, flavors to get uh, for the tracking. Uh, we have uh, hybrids, what I explained just now. So the detector is uh, uh, separated by electronic and connected by band bonding. We can have in monolithic, so uh, what I described before, the, M the maps or the, the maps. Uh, so we can have a detector with gain or no gain. Of course, we can include uh, gain also in, uh, in maps. And of course, then we have a lot of more possibility. We can use uh, different materials, different geometries, a lot of designs. I mean, the message that I want to give is there is no really a unique solution. Uh, R&D must be defined by the specific needs. So each experiment needs its own R&D uh, to find the optimum uh, detector for their application. Uh, so I want to give just few, very few examples. Uh, for example, field factor. This was a, a problem, let's say, from, uh, for LGATs when you go to small pixels because the area between two pixels, well, there is no multiplication. So when a particle goes through this uh, area here, we'll not see any gain. So, I mean, you still detector see the signal because it's active, but the timing will be different. So it's not a problem for uh, hits, but it's a problem for timing. There were a lot of ideas during the years, many of them developed by RD50, in, within the RD50 collaborations. Uh, and, well, this is something that is going on, and there are always new ideas, uh, and the people thinking uh, new design, new technology, new forms of doing the detector. Uh, another problem that this was very, I mean, this was really uh, scary for the experiments was this, uh, um, this damage that we found. Well, when you radiate a detector, the gain layer, which is made of boron, standard boron, uh, gets deactivated. So the boron uh, uh, combines with, uh, with the oxygen and, uh, well, it gets deactivated. So we, we lose the, um, the dopant the, the implant. So the, the, the dopant implant uh, becomes smaller as a function of, uh, of um, fluence. And this means that the gain will decrease. So in order to copy with the decrease of the gain, of course, we have to increase the bias. And what was found at test beams, but not in the in labs, so this was first seen only in the test beam, is that we get uh, a, the, um, I mean, really a destructive breakdown. So this is really a hole, a particle that, a high energy particle, which or a particle that creates a lot of ionization in the detector, at high, high bias voltage on the order of 600, 700 volts, really destroy, melt the, the silicon, and of course the detector stops working. So this is not acceptable in an experiment. You cannot have a detector with holes. Uh, and uh, there were different solutions proposed. For example, one was to include carbon, carbon co-implantation, which mitigated the, the gain loss because uh, will combine with the oxygen, so boron doesn't get uh, um, deactivated. Uh, changing the doping profile, so uh, with the same um, uh, ion implantation, with the same dose, if we change the shape of the, of the, um, of the implant, we can have a better, uh, a lower uh, deactivation of the boron. And uh, at the moment, the radiation hardness of LGATs, I would say that it has been proved up to two times 10 to the 50 neutron equivalents uh, per centimeter square. Uh, so, just to give an example, this is a, a technology that was developed for high energy physics, but what I've seen in many conferences is that there are many people working on, of course, different flavor of LGAT, but for many different applications. So, from nuclear physics, uh, space application, synchrotron, there's a lot of interest in synchrotron application, neutron imaging or security, and of course, medical application. So, there is a real lot of uh, interest for this technology. Uh, when we go to extreme uh, fluences, so we want to have a detector that works at extreme fluence. Well, first we have to say what is extreme fluence. But I think when uh, the CERN, well, the, the LG started, this number uh, was 10 to the 14 neutron equivalents. When I started my PhD, this was 10 to the 15. Then for the upgrade was 10 to the 16. Now when we look at the extreme fluence is uh, I mean, the, the, the experiment that we normally uh, take as an example is the FCC. 
in proton-proton colliders, of course, uh, collisions. Uh, and uh, we have this number here is uh, for the inner tracker, we expect 5, 6, 10 to the 70 neutrons equivalent. But if you look at the forward calorimeter, it can go to 10 to the 18. Right, this is real. And of course, we want the detector with time resolution of 10 picoseconds. So to ask, uh, that's simple. <laughs> Uh, when we look, uh, I mean, if you just do some back on the envelope uh, calculation, and uh, we, we say that we can replace the detector every year, which is maybe not really uh, feasible, uh, we end up with very huge current per detector, so milliampers per centimeter square, uh, depletion voltage hundreds of kilovolts, uh, and uh, trapping of uh, Picosecond. So if we extrapolate to this trapping to no charge, to signal, I mean, our signal uh, will be much lower than, uh, than the any noise. So it really looks impossible, I mean, to use silicon for the future experiment. Uh, but what happened when we go in the lab and we really measure the detectors? Well, we found some strange uh, expectation. I mean, the, the, what we found is not what we expect. So when we look at the current, uh, we use uh, this uh, formula, this is the, um, I mean, the extrapolation of the current at uh, high fluencies. It works very well. I mean, fits very well up to 10 to the 16, but we see is that the current saturates. So this is what we expect, and this is what we found. So that's good signal. Uh, when you look at trapping, the same. Uh, we get an order, of, more or less, an order of magnitude higher trapping than, uh, uh, than what we expect. So, fine. When we look at signal, well, we get, you maybe don't see the signal, but that's important to just to see that thin detector, they get higher signal than thick detector. So something not expected because, well, the, the, the signal should be proportional to the thickness of the detector. And if we try to do measurements, these are measurements, no extrapolation, we see that what you expect for a, a detector of 300 micron at uh, 10 to the 70 neutron equivalent at biased at 600 volt, we get uh, for a thin detector, 75 micron thick, we get a signal that is more or less three times higher, well, a little bit less than three times, but three times higher, but well, that's not bad. Of course, we are not considering noise, power consumption, cooling. So the message is that, well, even if silicon is the most studied material, well, it's not very well understood. Uh, and uh, this can be a problem. Uh, we need to do a sure more studies and try to understand why our uh, uh, prediction don't fit the, the data. So it is not hopeless. There are uh, uh, solutions to mitigate this problem. Uh, one is to go to the um, 3D, what's called 3D te technology. This was proposed uh, many years ago by Sherwood Parker. Uh, the idea is to decouple the um, I mean, the, the collection distance, so the thickness of the detector from the electrode distance. So in 3D, we have cylindrical electrodes, but we can put very close together. So we have all the advantages of a thin detectors, but with a thick substrate. Uh, they have a field factor of 100%. They can operate a very low, well, lower voltage than a standard planner, uh, short uh, drift distance, so less trapping. And they already been installed in IBL, in Atlas, and the FP, so the technology that has been used. And they are in some way pre-qualified uh, for the Atlas and CMS upgrade for the innermost layer of these two experiments. So they can withstand, say, without much problem, uh, fluence of up 10 to the say, 16 neutrons equivalents. When we go to high fluences, there are some uh, results. We see that even at three times 10 to the 17, well, we still have signals and at much lower operational voltage than uh, planar detectors. So there is hope. There is hope to work at these very high fluences. Uh, we have, uh, um, the idea is we could use different uh, uh, substrate, not only silicon, maybe we can couple this geometry to other materials. And of course, there will be a lot of work for the next years. Uh, so timing, of course, we said we also want timing. Again, with the 3D, it's possible to have a very good timing performance. Just an advice, this is only true for small pixels because the capacity of 3D increase very fast. So these results are true when we go to small pixel, which means on the order of 50, maybe less than 100 micron uh, pitch. Uh, we had first results that show that even at high uh, fluences, 10 to the 16, we can have 
uh, 40 picoseconds on time resolution. There is a very nice initiative from uh, INFN, it's called TimeSpot, which are developing, uh, uh, well, this is a, another flavor, let's call it 3D, is called uh, Trencher 3D, which have a more uniform electric field. But they are developing, what is important is they are developing the detector and the electronics, this uh, TimeSpot uh, ASIC, at the same time. So this is very important because uh, uh, then you can optimize both at the same time. And th what they found is that, what I said before, the time resolution of this detector is dominated by the electronics, not by the detector. So they had to improve their electronics, maybe going to fast uh, silicon and germanium BCMOS, uh, to get better time resolution. So we don't know what are the limits of 3D, so this is something that uh, must be studied. Uh, just to give a short uh, summary of diamond, uh, I mean, diamond is a very nice material, and uh, has a low capacity, low noise, uh, works at a high temperature, fast signal. There's been a lot of progress in the last 25 years. It's been used in many, uh, even at CERN for, uh, for a beam monitoring. Uh, it's been used in many applications uh, in dosimetry, uh, especially for new hadron or electron therapy like in flash. Uh, synchrotron, of course, space, DPUV detectors, uh, neutron, because it will stand very high temperature. Um, but, of course, when we look at the damage, I mean, you see the same problem than uh, other uh, semiconductors. So, the, the trapping also affects uh, diamond detectors. So, the idea that was proposed is to go to 3D. In this case, they use a laser, uh, it's called laser graphitization because it's just making a conductive layer in diamond, so it's no, they don't make really holes, they, they just make the, the, the diamond conductive. Uh, it's possible to do many fancy shapes, uh, so you see you can make holes in all directions, and well, they prove that when you go to diamond in 3D geometry, the, the signal improves a lot uh, at high fluence. Uh, of course, there are problems with diamonds. Uh, it's not clear if you can do mass production. Mass production means even few square meters. Uh, it's not clear if you can fabricate larger detectors where large means, in this case, a few centimeters uh, because of the quality of the material. So, I mean, it's interesting for some application, but for large detectors, there are still some limitations. Silicon carbide, I would just to give a very short uh, introduction. So, silicon carbide, well, the, the use of silicon is, is a material that is between silicon and, and diamond, so it has a, a lot of uh, interesting uh, properties. Um, the, between 10 and 20 percent of a semiconductor market now is on silicon carbide. Because why? Because uh, well, it's used in uh, electric uh, vehicles, so that's very important. Uh, there is a big rise of, uh, of use of silicon carbide, of course, as a switcher. No, as a detector. Uh, there are a lot of companies in Euros that are leading this technology, like uh, Infineon or uh, ST Microelectronics. Uh, I don't see the laser. Uh, but okay, uh, it's also used in space. For example, this was used in uh, Baby Colombo missions. And uh, well, there are, of course, a uh, lot of uh, R&D to do. We don't know exactly the, the noise performance. There is limited in the thickness because the epitaxial can be grow up to 150 micron. It's more expensive than silicon. So I think there is a lot of work to do on this material. Just to conclude uh, uh, with the materials, there is, of course, 2D materials. Well, the example is graphene, but there are many other 2D materials. There is not much study on this, uh, on this topic. In my opinion, we should encourage people, especially young people, to work on that. The only uh, sample we have is on uh, germanium fat. This is not really direct uh, uh, detection uh, of radiation. It's, for me, it's a kind of a dosimeter more than a real uh, detector. Uh, so we should have really new ideas, and uh, we should encourage people to work on that. It's a lot of high potential, of course. Uh, just let me conclude with the facilities. Uh, of course, to do R&D on detectors, we need to fabricate detectors, but then we need test beam facilities, radiation facility. We need to look at the industrialization because until now, large area detectors have been built outside Europe, for example. Uh, and, uh, well, we have the sample of this European project. So I'll leave the conclusion because my time is over, so I don't want to. <laughs> but I'll leave the conclusion written here. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> for that. So,
For the diamond materials, I mean, there had been the problem with the with the contact uh, with the contacts on the surface that degraded very fast. Is this still the case, or? I think they are solving this problem. I mean, for at least from the last paper, I've seen that there's been improvement. Of course, I don't know the technology because people don't say exactly, but I don't know. Daniela, if you know more on the technology that they used, uh, because... Oh, the, ah, no, okay, I thought you want to do to comment. No, I, I don't know exactly what they use because normally this depends on the quality of your contact with the material. So there is a lot of secret, let's say, on the way you treat the surface before you deposit your metals or normally it's a combination of metals. Uh, but at least for the experiment I've seen, uh, there was some improvement. Of course, when we go to 3D, that's even more complicated because the, your contact is inside the material. <laughs> so this is not, of course, a perfect contact. It's a kind of graphite. So there will be always some resistance. And uh, I mean, it's not easy. I'm, <laughs> it's not easy, easy material to work, diamond. Uh, so uh, everybody loves timing. Uh, it's uh, really <laughs> going in every direction. Every community is interested, etc. Uh, so, Zelgat has this limitation. Can you do better with Zelgat or is really the 3 d the trench 3 d is really at the end of your solution? Well, that's, uh, thanks for the question. It's a very difficult question to answer because uh, there are a lot of people working on that. Uh, as I said, we are trying to do engineering, so changing, for example, the doping, the type of doping we use for the, for the, this, uh, yeah, no, well, no, the carbon, but the, we use boron, of course, boron and co implantation with carbon, but the, what is, uh, creates the junction is the boron, uh, because carbon is inactive. But you could use other materials. For, for example, you could use aluminium, that is also pitai, uh, and this has not been studied very well at the moment. So there is still possibly to change and to see if we can decrease this boron, uh, this, uh, well, the um, acetal removal in. Uh, uh, in, uh, in silicon. Uh, I don't know if the limit we can really solve this. I mean, the acetone mule happens always. <laughs> we can decrease it, but we, seem to, we need to check. Uh, down. So there are projects in RB50, I, I could not comment, but. And AIDA. And AIDA, of course, sorry. And AIDA. <laughs> Uh, that okay. are looking at this, uh, at this uh, problem. And uh, maybe we can extend, maybe 5, 10 to the 15, this will be reasonable. Maybe we'll never go to 10 to the 16, because then uh, the substrate starts to be important. Uh, but, uh, OK. Yeah. So and if there's another question, thank you again, uh, thank you. Uh, Giulio. And the next, uh, next speaker is on calorimetry and uh, Simon Eich. <laughs> so I was asked to uh, talk a little bit about calorimetry, and uh, I understood that I should address a bit the synergies that are possible between the different uh, communities that we have here on site. So I will spend my time uh, not to discuss in detail the wells of different systems that are available, because there are really many. But what I would like to discuss with you is a bit uh, what is the enabling techniques from a nuclear structure physicist's point of view, which is maybe also a bit uh, different from the usual perception here. I mean, I'm not talking about Panda, I'm not talking about Hades, I'm talking about nuclear physics with some GV beams, where the aim is to uh, look for a structure investigation. And uh, also uh, uh, would like to address the cross fertilization into the, also in the commercial sectors and stress there's of course a lot of similarities between the demands in our community. And the idea is of course to see the, what the typical demands are defined, for instance in roadmap documents. And then we go through a few examples where uh, synergies are explored. And calorimetry is uh, accompanied by different methods in order to identify the interaction points. This is a little bit going into the direction, how do I track through my detector? And in nuclear physics, typically, you don't have the, the large energies at hand, I mean, in, in, in my field. So you have to do a, a hybrid detector systems where you start with uh, different uh, tracking systems in front of your calorimetry uh, material. And I would uh, use as an example the target calorimetry for 
high energy nuclear physics, where high energy nuclear physics in that case means this GV range, and uh, where the interaction point, as I already mentioned, is key in order to understand where we are going. And a good uh, example is, of course, uh, the FCAT detector roadmap, where you find, so to say, for the different systems. Can you get close yes, to the I can. Can you hear me like that? Uh, I think they don't. We hear you, but they don't hear you in the street. Okay, so they I have to be. I stand like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I will use the different examples that are shown here. And uh, uh, what, you, what you see, for instance, if you look at this, uh, is that you uh, take as a starting point in order to define your needs different machines. And uh, this is, of course, particular also for this community that you say, okay, I have my interaction. I have a certain luminosity at the point given by the machine. I know, in principle, the methods that I need to apply, so I can deduce the parameters of my detector. I know, in the end, that I need things like uh, pileup compensation, things like that, because I know, so to say, what is coming out from these kind of exercises. If we uh, go to my uh, field, I will show you in a minute what, uh, why this is a little bit different and why it's so complicated to come to these kind of conclusions. But what you see is always this uh, variation about the same theme. You get the uh, idea about front-end processing. You discuss about low power if you, take about, uh, if you uh, discuss large channel count, high granularity. And uh, in that case, uh, of course, you get into the different uh, regions. For instance, if you then uh, go to timing uh, requirements, what you have now in the next years is a timing requirement like 10 to 100 picoseconds. This is something that we also can add and uh, cross-fertilize in the sense that, for instance, we can test systems and things like that. Um, if I go now to the field I would be uh, discussing, of course, uh, our uh, a uh, big uh, installation would be the fair facility where, you, where the part that I would be discussing is the, the, the super affairs and the associated experiments. And uh, so you have here a production of secondary beams starting from a very much increased primary beam intensity. And then you have uh, uh, the, the, the experiments on site and there are actually many. So we're not discussing only one kind of experiment, we're discussing uh, the low energy branch experiments, which is the things that uh, Gerda addressed in her talk about uh, wrapping measurements and uh, uh, radial measurements, relative radial measurements. You have here this branch where you uh, this have an installation where you can do reaction studies. You would like to have the ring branches where you can do ring studies, which have a completely different instrumentation. And I would focus now on the middle part. And yes, no, of course. Yep. So, um, what we are into is to build a, a, a powerful a separator for exotic nuclei. And that means you start here from a primal beam intensity that is very high and has also increased. But the main key, uh, idea is, is to have a, a, a separator where I'm deeply involved. And uh, we, we, we reduce, so to say, uh, <laughs> by selecting out the isotopes that we want the primary beam intensity to a very large extent. So at the, in the end, what you're discussing is usable intensity at the experiment, which is much lower than, of course, the, high, uh, the, 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 the initial luminosity on target. So this roadmap idea that you say, okay, I have my rec, uh, prerequisites given simply by the fact that I increase my primary interaction rate is a little bit different. So what you'd like to optimize here, actually, is to have the maximum possible rate that is achievable, and this is more or less given by the detector physics and nothing else. And this is what we are aiming at, because everything else is, so to say, uh, giving us uh, that time, unnecessary that time, that would hinder us to do what we want to do. And what we have currently uh, is an installation in the old facility, uh, still uh, coupled to the uh, uh, CIS-18 at the old uh, uh, facility, and what we can do there is a precursor setup is, of course, to study all the setups in a way that we can understand where the issues, so once we're moving, we have a, a reasonable system. 
And the physics example that I want to show, because it uh, benefits from, so to say, more or less all things, is uh, inverse scattering. Uh, so you produce a, a secondary beam of instable particles. So you have to do inverse reaction on a proton target if you want to do a P2P. And what you do is then you have to identify initial beam, you have a final beam that you want to identify, and what you want to measure in your calorimeter is the protons, the recoiling protons, where you have to reconstruct the position on target and things like that and look for the correlations. And the whole way how then the calorimeter is built is then given by the physics that imposes the scientific re uh, requirements. So you need a huge dynamic range, obviously, because you're getting gamma rays up to 700 MeV charged particles. You have a high efficiency, good resolution, high granularity, Doppler correction you need, so you need the tracking, and uh, you have to do this particle identification. And uh, just to put this a little bit into perspective, I mean, when we are discussing, so to say, the, the, the resolution that we are talking about, if you go then to a plot that the, I, I found, where you look, so to say, what is the achievable resolution, uh, we are here, actually, because the energies are so low. So there's also a difference. I mean, if you, of course, have a wealth of uh, uh, yeah, light available, then, of course, you get a good resolution, but we're, we're talking about uh, the, the, this first part of the curve, which makes it a little bit more complicated. So uh, we need spectroscopic properties, obviously, because we want to see the gammas and the calorimetry for the, for the protons, and then we go along. And I would start then with the tracking device. This is one of the super FS. And here, actually, uh, we need a rate capability of several megahertz. Because here, you know, in the, in the, in the first part of the separator, where you really need uh, the, this, uh, uh, to cope with these high primary beam intensities uh, that, uh, that you want to uh, achieve. And what you do then is, uh, here, for instance, we build on a gem TPC design. Well, we put uh, two gem TPCs actually in opposite direction in order to uh, remove the ambiguities in the reconstruction and be sure about the positions. And what you need in the end is a rate capability of some megahertz, which is not easy to achieve, obviously, because even the transport time is in this range. And uh, what we would like to uh, uh, get is then this uh, Biro identification, and this defines then what you need. This is a position resolution, depending on your separator, on the ion optics, of course, in order of a millimeter timing resolution. Again, you see the numbers, it's several tens of picoseconds that we need to uh, achieve. And the energy resolution, and this is also a constant now during my talk, which is in the order of a percent or so, in order to be safe. And, and this is the challenging part, you need this uh, in, a, in a large dynamic range, because you can expect protons up to uranium in the separator with all the fragments. And uh, due to the extent of the, the device, what you actually would like to have is a timestamp readout so that you can refer to a time reference and uh, reconstruct the local time, so to say, on the spot. Now, yeah, and then one could pose the question, what has a gem TPC for high rate tracking to do with the Panda EMC? And uh, it turns out that, of course, we uh, rely on ASICs uh, and uh, pre-amplifiers available. And a large dynamic range means, of course, also that they should be, to a certain extent, configurable, and what was the starting point actually for our exercises was the upflow ASIC that was specifically built for that in the 350 nanometer AMS process still, where you have two, two, two outputs with uh, different gains to start with, and then you can see whether this is sufficient. And this is actually a way how this cross-fertilization works. You have a system at hand that is available, and then you start playing and see whether it can address your specific questions. And, okay, you have a digital interface for configuration, rate per channel, something like 350 kilohertz possible. This is exactly what you need. And this is the, is the same for the gem TPC. The power is small, which is in, in this gem TPC uh, application not such a big issue because you have comparatively small systems that you can couple to a heat sink. For instance, the separator, which is a lot of material. So this is not a big constraint in our case. Then uh, we started uh, to play and we found actually that, first of all, the availability of the process is not there and we, we need to be future uh, safe. And we made actually our own ASIC design. And uh, here you have done an ASIC with an adaptive gain in a newer process. 
And the, 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 the dynamic range is really huge, which makes it possible uh, that it could be used, for instance, also as the building block for the Pampana detector again. So this is just, the, uh, uh, again, an idea. So you build up on, on common knowledge. You build a, a system that is the end usable. So you see here in the ASIC design, you have the SuperFS and Panda in the, in the same uh, system. Of course, and this is the novice the question, you have also in the chips like the VMM3 that come from the different community that are also highly configurable, more or less a Swiss Army knife where you can do everything. But turns out, for instance, that we are still not in the end of the evaluation, that here the dynamic range is slightly too small, so we have to, uh, it, it would not be sufficient. But this is really then, once you have these uh, different developments at hand, you enable that you can have a choice. And this enables you to uh, build a reasonable system in the end. And the other thing where power plays a role is uh, if you do uh, uh, target tracking, I mean, here you have now uh, our starting point. If you want to do inverse proton scattering, you need protons. OK, you can pro uh, put protons in a polyethylene foil, which is sort of a proton, but it has some carbon inside, which is not so good. And a better choice is actually to have a liquid hydrogen target. And uh, if you start like that, uh, then, of course, you would come up with a, with a box geometry around the target in order to reconstruct protons. Here you see AMS detectors. And the good thing about these is they were built initially for space application and they have very low power. And you see here the space that is available for this kind of integration is not very large and you need to operate in vacuum. So, uh, of course, you have to make sure that the heat uh, dissipation is not too high in order also not to, to put too much material here in the way to the out, outlying uh, calorimeter. Uh, so here also the material budget, of course, plays a role. And this is actually now uh, uh, the, the, the novel uh, system that we will put in, in action in roughly 10 days from now, which is based on yet another system, which is the food uh, silicon detectors uh, with uh, own readout uh, system that were built as uh, initially for uh, cancer therapy treatment and the like. And uh, what we have here is then the, the strip detectors and with the with with ideas chip to be read out. So this is in principle the evolution of the Amplex chip that was initially available at CERN. Then uh, you, you get, so to say, the low power version, the VA chip, which uh, uh, was then in the end transferred into the ideas uh, IDE 1140. So this is, so to say, a technology branch that simply makes possible to build something like that. Actually, you operate silicon detectors in a close vicinity to liquid hydrogen target, uh, where you cannot put too much heat in, obviously, in order to keep it still liquid. And of course, uh, our dream, and this we have seen in the previous talk, is uh, to, to surround the target with a detector. And if you want to surround the target with a detector, the detector can be bent. And we're all happy if the detector can be bent, because then it's also thin. And if you still see our protons, we're fine. It's actually what we are aiming for. And what you get is actually is now that you for the for the Alpine detectors, you get some sort of uh, test bench we can start playing with. And this is actually the message: in order to, to allow that people can work with these systems, you need these kind of this, uh, of things available. Uh, of course, you have then the specific questions of your experiment to be addressed. Sorry. Um, in our case, this is uh, if you if you have more heavier beams, the suppression of delta rays that uh, will of course call, uh, create a, a huge background on the detector system, and you have to be sure that you can discriminate from the rest. So this is then the part of uh, exercises we have to do to tailor the system for our needs. And in the end, uh, in an artistic view, the thing looks like that. You see, you see the target calorimeter. You see the, ta the target itself, and you see some holding structures for the detectors. This is the whole device. And actually, the developments that are in here is the holding as such. Because what is a calorimeter? A calorimeter is essentially the material that you want to have, and the holding structure, to a certain extent, is just uh, inactive material that you want to avoid. And the way to avoid this is to have this uh, 
thing that goes back to the Siemens ECAL that you just have a, a frame, a holding frame from uh, carbon fiber that is uh, in Avioli. And uh, you can uh, have also then the barrel design like that. And if you look for the Panda barrel, it will look the same. So this is adopted technology meanwhile. Uh, what we did specifically is uh, uh, we started from the uh, CMS APD readout with, uh, with a certain type of the, of the APDs that were, uh, that were used there, suited to the geometry. There's another type for the panda calorimeter, uh, which had already the, the right uh, size, but not the, 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 the right shape. And we made a, uh, another study with Hamamatsu, so with industry, in order to get our uh, detector types going. So we have now this uh, double um, APDs uh, in use. So if you look now for the uh, Khalifa barrel, you have this part now covered. This is the cesium iodide part, which is the essential calorimeter part. And then in the front end, in the front, to the front, of course, you get the, the boost particles. So you have to do something. And you have different kinds of solutions, like uh, IFOS, uh, a force switch solution with an uh, intrinsic uh, uh, force, and uh, the SIPA, which uh, should have been based on London and bromide and London and chloride. So we're talking about different materials here. And you see here that uh, you can use this to, to a certain extent. But here also the, the technology, of course, has been developed and also the, the way to analyze these things has been developed by other people and we, we're adopting to, to a certain extent. If you look for the Paris White Book, for instance, you see this uh, London and bromide uh, sodium iodide uh, for switch. You see the way how, uh, how one is working with that. For the intrinsic force switch, we, have, we see the uh, different methods, how to uh, get from the short and long components. This is actually a thing where you can optimize, because I mean, this, uh, you don't have to work with double windows. Once you have a something electronic running there, you can do a lot of tricks. For instance, for in gamma discrimination, you can do uh, an online uh, FPGA processing so that you get the perfect uh, uh, discrimination. So there's a, there's a lot of work that one can do in here. And uh, we actually face now the problem that it seems that we have, a, a, with one of the uh, crystal types, we have the problem that we have this too, too strong position dependence. And then you can, of course, try to use other materials as they are used, for instance, in this, what I found very nice, nanosatellites uh, uh, that are of a size like that and uh, our uh, gamma spectro uh, uh, spectrometer for gamma ray burst detection that you put in space. Uh, what you need for that is, again, technology. And uh, if, you, if you look now for this uh, spaghetti color, uh, calorimeter readout, what is aimed for, uh, for the, uh, in the R&D path here is 26 picoseconds at uh, 5 GB. And let's see how we cope with that. Uh, what we have uh, developed is uh, based on this uh, initial paper that, that, that you can use appuse actually the, the, the delay line of an FPGA to have a, a time sampler uh, that you can build PDCs actually at no cost um, with, uh, with a very, very good time resolution. We are right now down to seven picoseconds per channel. Uh, so you so can use that, of course in order to have a very easy timing resolution. And at the same time, if you do time over threshold, you can, of course, achieve also very good uh, uh, um, energy resolution, which is also of uh, uh, very much interest. So actually, if you apply this to, 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 to a simple plastic scintillator top wall, you can go down to numbers that you have a, 40 pic a 14 picoseconds time resolution for the time of flight whilst you have still have an energy resolution in the percent region. So just the availability of this uh, 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 PDCs based on FPGAs, of course, makes all this uh, very easily possible. And you have to combine it with something that is also broad use. And this is, uh, in our case, the White Rabbit Network, um, which is also in use everywhere in the, uh, in the community. For instance, everywhere where you have a somewhat extended uh, set up, like for instance in the case 3Mnet, you rely on a local time base that is defined to a few tens picoseconds of uh, precision, something like that. And this is actually what is going on there. Um, so we have this campus wide and we can do the, 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 the spectroscopy with that. 
And then, of course, if you're talking about uh, uh, fully digital electronics, I mean, you have seen in the discussion uh, here, for instance, if you, if you take uh, the, 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 the prime example, which is the, 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 the uh, Agata Gamma uh, tracking array, uh, then, of course, what you want to achieve is that you uh, sample your signals all over the place and by the mirror charges and the, the way how the signals are distributed together with pulse-shaped uh, uh, information in a sampler, which is not running at a very high frequency. You could, in principle, uh, deduce the positions and the, 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 interact uh, I mean the, the scattering points inside the crystal and do a full reconstruction of the, of the process there. Actually, the initial concept was that uh, this, this position reconstruction uh, could have been done actually in the, in the sampler already with the help of uh, reasonably mapped crystals and having an FPGA code running on that. Uh, it turned out that the characterization, of course, because it's not easy to achieve something like that, takes a bit longer. But you have done the possibility just to go in the, in the software part at the expense that you have high data rates and can do the, the, the full reconstruction there. But once you have done this, of course, you can go back and implement again into the front end. And this is actually the, the ideas that we should have in many of the systems, because then we reduce the data rate from a global data rate that kills us to a local data rate where you can afford quite a bit because processing power front end near is available if you're not in a too confined uh, geometry and that actually enables you to do a lot of very, very nice things. And then we just had the discussion, uh, if, of course, if you go from an analog uh, silicon PM to a digital photon counter, you would, would imagine, of course, you can go a bit further and uh, use a bit more of the information that you have in your pixelized detector in order to have uh, uh, more grip on, the, on the, the way how the photons are distributed on your, on your active area. And then you're talking about implementations on the sensor level. Uh, the ultimate goal, of course, is then uh, some sort of 5D readout. I mean, you have a detection material, you know exactly where everything happens, you know when it happens, you know the energy, what was deposited, and you can do a lot of tricks there. And uh, here I cite, uh, so to say, from the ECFA paper, uh, pilot is not noise, just physics we are not interested in. Uh, and uh, we need more processing on detector beyond noise re rejection so that uh, one really characterizes the signal. And I just show you an example that we have done some years ago, namely to do a on an online pileup correction in an FPGA. So you have pileup, you have uh, the, the signals coming closer and closer in time. And they even overlap partially, and you do then uh, online decomposition. Of course, you need to assume certain things, like uh, in that case, it was the pulse shape, it was from a scintillator, it was possible. And you have to uh, treat with the dirt effects as soon as you saturate, of course, you will, shape your, uh, will change your shape and things like that. But you can do this online on a, on a single channel base. You can have the, 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 the sampler plus the associated electronics to do so. So here we need the 4D. And actually, one can use that also very nice if you think about uh, installation, like in our case, that is very widespread. You need to have quality control on the uh, individual detector channels. And once you have an FPGA running somewhere, you can also have a soft CPU running on it and uh, gather some sort of um, long-term statistics in order to make sure that the system is still working properly. And it's also something uh, that we are implementing, especially in view of SuperFS operation where you have no access to the tunnel. Yes, I'm done more or less. So I'm summarizing because the chairman asked me to. Um, so I, I, I hope I have uh, shown you a few enabling technologies with a hardware focus where common needs can be easily identified, uh, essentially, where you can see where, the, the, where people can work together. Uh, nuclear physics applications, as I've shown, often require a large dynamic range. So the, even the requirements point somehow to a calorimetric uh, <laughs> response that you would expect from the detectors. So it's also not such a clear separation line that you have tracking with Kalman tracking, then uh, somewhere a calorimeter, but this is all very much interspersed because you cannot have, afford to have too much material on the way. 
also in view of the limited energy that you're talking about. And uh, I, I hope I made the point that processing, processing in fondant is possible and allows you to uh, increase very much the quality of the data that you're achieving. Uh, of course, this can also mean that you have machine learning results implemented in a fondant. But I mean, even if we would uh, implement already the just uh, normal information we get from the detector system and uh, in, a, in a deductive way would be good enough. And the availability of sample systems, and this is something that I would address to the whole community, is of course key. If once you build a, a small detector system, you would work together with your collaborators, you have some sort of sample that you can present to somebody else and can say, okay, play with it and come back if you have a good solution for me. Of course, you can also do with other colleagues in the field, which means once you, you build these systems, build a few more and uh, we can talk about uh, cross fertilization in a certain sense. Uh, what is also a very good example is the wide rabbit time distribution system, because that one evolved uh, uh, with an uh, open heart and software license for instance, also in the German stock market, because people simply found out that if they do speed trading, they need timestamps at a certain precision, and this was good enough. And it's a normal network infrastructure, nothing bad. And then you start, okay, let's use it. And suddenly you have a producer for something, which also is beneficial for us, because uh, we can then buy the systems and things like that. Okay, so you I already mentioned. And uh, our starting point actually at that time was, uh, this is some 12 years ago, was to use a, a bunch timing system that was based on a laser uh, based distribution system of analog signals where you have to, in a, in a very complicated process, to recover, so to say, the clock again. Of course, if you have this via network infrastructure, it's much more easy. Okay, uh, so, uh, detector samples with or without readout systems I already mentioned. And uh, software methods actually one can later partially implement in order to uh, 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 um, get a better quality of the data that you can even implement also in the front end. So I would like to thank you for your attention. And I got a lot, also a wealth of material uh, from the people that I mentioned here. Thank you. Time for questions, if any. Yes. Um, thank you very much. You mentioned the White Rabbit system. And uh, uh, my question is, do you know about developments for a wireless White Rabbit system? <laughs> this is the same precision. <laughs> because this would be an astroparticle physics. That would I, be I really could imagine. Very nice. <laughs> I mean, what you, what you need to do, you, you need to implement, I mean, here it's, here it's done in the, in, the, in the receiver, the clocks are getting synchronized. You would need a sort of a synchronization uh, protocol, which is the uh, PPTP protocol in that case, that you implement on your receiver in the wireless uh, receiver, but then it's not a wireless receiver. If you just want to have a clock, I would say it's rather more interesting have a phase detection on both sides and make sure that they run, that you have two oscillators run on synchronous, which is closer to this Buddhist uh, system that I've shown you before, because there you distribute uh, a sine wave and make sure that the sine wave doesn't jitter by a feedback loop. And this, I think, is then the more straightforward way to synchronize the, any, the, the, the oscillators. Any other? Question. I mean, radio-based, this is uh, actually what is done because for the Buddhist system, we use the radio transceiver uh, that was actually used for satellite communication. So this is uh, then the more straightforward way that you synchronize there with phase table clock. Okay, so I do not see any hands raised. So thank you again, the speaker, the speaker for the session. And come back at uh, 11 uh, and now we have a coffee. Yes, uh, two announcements. The group photo is in the web page and please the students remove the posters because they will have to remove the panel. So please do it during coffee break. So enjoy the coffee.
Uh, so we are starting the uh, second part of uh, the last session of this morning. And the next speaker is going to cover cryogenic, which is very important for a lot of applications to our detectors and facilities. Uh, so it's a pleasure to welcome Stefan Groman from uh, KIT to speak about cryogenic in particle, astroparticle, and nuclear physics. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much. So I would like to thank the organizers uh, for this opportunity to talking about cryogenics here. And um, I will, if this is working. No, it's on, actually. But it's not working. It's on, so I've switched it on. Ah, okay. So, uh, so I will give a brief introduction, and then I will say a few words about temperature. Actually, because uh, there is no common understanding of uh, temperature in physics today. So then I will uh, go on to cryogenic cooling technology. I say a few words uh, about cryogenic system developments. And in the end, I finish with a nice example of a knowledge transfer. So um, actually, um, this shows uh, the application spectrum of refrigeration and cryogenics uh, on a, a Kelvin and the Celsius scale over uh, 12 orders of magnitude in cooling power. So uh, we have classical refrigeration down to minus 100 degrees C. Um, then we have process engineering. Basically, this is industrial gas processing. Here also, uh, the xenon comes from uh, the air liquefaction plants. And um, actually, for, for Darwin, we need a whole world year's production of uh, xenon for this experiment. So, and then um, cryogenic starts from below uh, 100 Kelvin around. So we have the high temperature superconductor applications. Hydrogen technology falls in this range. And then we have a, a variety of helium technology applications starting from small cryocoolers um, over some um, helium uh, liquid flyers and refrigerators up to large uh, installations such as CERN or the ITER project. And in the lower left corner, you will find also quantum technology operating on the millikelvin temperature range and with uh, cooling powers in the order of some microwatts. So um, uh, basically, refrigeration and cryogenics comprises all left-handed thermodynamic cycles. And we see the, these linear temperature scales do not resolve the cryogenics uh, so well. So that's why I want to say a few words about the temperature concepts. And uh, now, um, the, um, well, we all know the Celsius scale, the, um, which is empiric and interesting to know just at the time when it was uh, invented. Uh, the scale was uh, inverted because the uh, concept of negative numbers didn't exist at the time. So then the Kelvin scale is also semi-empiric because actually it comes from the air thermometer and uh, extrapolates towards uh, low pressure at constant volume. So this is uh, by application of the ideal gas law, which is only the simplest equation of state we know. And uh, beyond this, um, there's also a logarithmic temperature scale, which was actually um, proposed by the founder of our institute, uh, Rudolf Blank, uh, who founded the first refrigeration institute in the world in Karlsruhe in 1926. And um, unfortunately, this scale was not so successful because most of our uh, uh, fellow people out there, they are non-physicists. And um, now their daily uh, temperature range uh, is squeezed to a very narrow range uh, on this scale. So, but I want to actually comment on this relation between energy and temperature you see up there. And um, so there is a classical um, physical, uh, or, or there are actually two um, concepts uh, of temperature in physics today. We have this classical interpretation from kinetic theory um, where you basically start from a particle bouncing around in the cylinder, then you apply the classical pressure definition uh, of physics as force per unit area converted with uh, Newton's laws um, uh, related to kinetic energy, then you um, um, sum up um, for a large number of molecules, and in the end you apply the ideal gas law to relate somewhere the uh, mean translational kinetic energy with temperature. 
Now this uh, derivation actually has some problems because first of all the particles are considered as non-interacting point masses, um, which in fact is not consistent with other um, um, uh, parts of kinetic theory where actually their collision is absolutely necessary. And on the other hand also, we can see here that uh, in fact both temperature and pressure are related uh, to kinetic energy in this uh, derivation. So um, if you look uh, at the theoretical definition um, of temperature from statistical mechanics, so this is basically built on the, um, on the um, combinatorics of two state systems we were uh, listening to for the quantum computing yesterday already, but in contrast um, uh, to looking at some individual states, we are actually looking at the assembly. And temperature, in fact, is a property of this assembly. Here you see the inverse of temperature is the partial derivative of entropy in terms of energy. And uh, this um, general um, say concept also holds for the other intensive state properties, which are the like pressure and uh, chemical potential, which are uh, derived by this uh, partial derivatives. So uh, this concept actually opens also the, the concept of negative absolute temperatures in systems of limited total energy. And this concept was already uh, proposed in 51, then uh, later, in 94, it was uh, proven to be real by Harkon and Lunasma in Helsinki. And now lately in 2013, uh, it was shown that um, negative temperatures are stable also for motional degrees uh, of freedom. So this is um, interesting. And um, um, I want to point out here understanding of thermodynamics is um, interesting or important because actually if we assume this concept of negative um, absolute temperatures um, to be correct, then actually this interpretation with the equipartition theorem, which is well known, uh, cannot hold because um, if for negative temperatures, so this would imply in fact also negative energies a concept, which to my understanding does not exist. So, but thermodynamically, we, we, what is actually um, um, also a strong point is that classical kinetic theory yields actually a constant of the uh, specific heat capacity uh, for the ideal gas or for the perfect gas, which is monoatomic. So in this, in fact, is incompatible with the third law of thermodynamics that requires that the specific heat goes to zero at the low temperature limit. So, and this can be supported by some very nice experimental data for helium-3, you can see on this plot. And um, what is interesting to note that the specific heat here um, already drops uh, at around 20 Kelvin below the ideal gas limit, which is very hard to explain with classical kinetic theory. And what you can nicely see here that this behavior can actually be modeled by a Debye equation of state. So, and um, now, this has nothing to do with quantum effects because for helium-3 here at 20 Kelvin, we are four orders of magnitude away from superfluidity. So this is a, a very interesting results and it tells us in fact that the phonon concept, which is behind the Debye theory, can also be applied to gaseous phases. So I would conclude from here that uh, so the particle movement, uh, all particles move in particle wave functions always and not as in such as in kinetic theory in straight lines. And I some, sometimes wonder if this uh, thermodynamic perspective is not relevant for some other fields um, of physics um, here. So, but now let's uh, from this kind of theoretical excourse, let's move to uh, cryogenic cooling technologies. So uh, first of all, uh, I want to do this with an example here of a recent um, a study we participated in is the co this compact light study uh, is an EU project was a conceptual design study for the next generation hard X-ray uh, free electron laser facility. So this is a typical beam line with some 16 cryo modules con containing superconducting magnets. We have a cooling power in the kilowatt range at a nitrogen temperature and 70 watt at 4K. So we investigated two possible options for cooling technology. Option A is you use multiple cryo coolers and the largest one you can buy on the market has uh, just 2.7 watt at 4 Kelvin. And on the other hand, you can use the smallest cryo plant, uh, which has a 100 watt at 4.2 Kelvin. So you notice already there's a large technology gap in between. So now even though 
most users, they like this uh, terminology. In fact, so uh, cryo cooler is not cryogen free and the cryo plant is, has very little to do with um, mechanical cooling. So the key player in any thermodynamic cycle is the working fluid and in this case here, it's helium. I will come back to this point um, later on. So now when we compare these two options, uh, you see for um, option A in such a beamline, we need 48 cryo coolers, which amounts to something like 4.2 million euros investment. And for the smallest helium plant, including transfer line and so on, so we, need, we are in the same order of magnitude for the investment. What makes a difference is really the power consumption, and this is important in terms, in terms of sustainability. So if you use cryo coolers, we have about eight to 10 times the power consumption in such a system compared to a helium plant. So this is really an important aspect. So now, um, now my animations were gone here, so, but I, do, I, I want to actually now reflect on what are potentials for um, cryogenic developments, cooling system developments. So if you look on the left, you see this is the simplest possible cycle you can imagine. You need at least a compressor, some heat exchanger at the ambience, counterflow heat exchanger, the expansion valve, and some piping. So this is the simplest possible cycle, and it's very bad in terms of efficiency. It works with nitrogen, but it will not work with um, hydrogen or helium. So. Uh, and the question is, um, how can you improve the efficiency of such a system is basically looking at the right. You see just an example, the cloth cycle. Um, without going into details, the general statement is you can increase the efficiency of any thermodynamic cycle by increasing its complexity. So you can put more components, etc. Uh, the problem is, um, in this particular case, we have cold expanders, so you, uh, the investment, the cost increases. And you have a problem with scalability actually to low power because you cannot pay the, pay the specific cost. So in fact, if we use this approach, we are at the state of the art of um, cryogenic technology today and there's very little margin for efficiency improvement. But there is another way to change this, and this is going back to the left now by manipulating the fluid properties. Remember, the key player is the working fluid in any thermodynamic cycle. So what we can actually do, we can manipulate the fluid properties by mixing different fluids. So this is in fact the only way for a substantial technology improvement in cryogenics, which is not completely exploited yet. And uh, the beauty is that it is scalable over all power ranges and uh, basically doesn't uh, add la uh, much cost, but uh, thermodynamically it's uh, pretty uh, complex. So um, now I want to uh, talk about uh, from just the, the, the cooling systems to some uh, specific um, cryogenic system developments. and. Uh, now, for the first part already for uh, currently, this adopts actually this concept of uh, mixed refrigerant cycles. So why is this important? Because in many accelerator systems or in the beamline I just showed, the current leads actually, they are the main uh, heat sources in cryogenic systems in, in this um, compact light study. It's about 70% of the heat load coming from the current leads. And uh, so we are, um, if you see uh, on the left, the simplest solution is just by conduction cooling and you absorb the heat load all at the cold end. This is the simplest, uh, but it's the least efficient. So um, the most efficient is actually when you continuously absorb the heat over the entire temperature range. And in order to do this, um, um, we have to do two things, actually. The first thing is to adapt uh, the fluid properties which we are doing here by white boiling mixtures, actually. And then the second thing is because now we have um, small gradients for, uh, for energy transfer in form of heat, which makes it efficient, so we need a large surface. And uh, this is done actually by a microstructure design uh, you see at the bottom, so where we are uh, developing this microstructured current leads here, and you see a prototype which is uh, very compact and can carry about uh, 10 kilo amps. So on, on the right, you see just a new test stand we are just building now where we will be able to um, develop this technology towards um, uh, higher um, TRL 
And um, what the potential here is that we can reduce the power consumption compared to conduction cooling to one third. So this is enormous and don't be mistaken then for many other uh, um, say systems, cooling systems you have in uh, accelerators and so on. I mean, typically the margins for efficiency improvement are very small and not on this factor. So this is an exceptional case, but it shows the potential. Okay, now I want to um, say, uh, give just uh, some examples also for cryogenic system developments. One example is um, for the Karlsruhe tritium neutrino experiment, and then I give another example uh, for the Einstein telescope. So for the Einstein telescope, you see we will have this um, um, beautiful triangle at, um, uh, with a 10 kilometer arm length and installed at 200 to 300 meters underground. So, uh, well, first for Katrin, actually, um, in order to have this sensitivity of the experiment, we needed an extremely stable source, and the source is the blue cryostat you see on the upper left corner here. So, about 90% of all the systematics in this um, experiment are actually determined by the source, and um, so we, at the time, we developed a particular beam tube cooling system there, which was uh, built on a neon uh, thermosiphon. Now, Without going into details, what came out in the end actually that the performance of this entire system was determined by just one tiny little heat exchanger, which is a very obscure design here, which has a lead core floating uh, in an uh, intermediate volume in there. So, um, and with this design, we, we achieved a temperature stability of five times 10 to minus five at 30 Kelvin. So this was even an order of magnitude more stable compared to our specs. So I want to point out here that understanding requirements and solutions in such complex system developments is essential and it's typically it's not obvious from the beginning where the bottlenecks are. So the other, uh, so for Katrin, um, just um, there have been some intermediate uh, results published recently in Nature Physics. So you see uh, here we have the first EV, uh, ever sub-EV limit by direct neutrino mass. Uh, measurement and uh, this limit is presently at 0.8 uh, electron volts, whereby only a, a small fraction of the data are yet evaluated. So in order to have statistics, um, uh, Katrin will run for uh, some more years. Now, um, let me talk about uh, the Einstein telescope. Um, now, um, and first I, I talk about the cryogenic infrastructure. Uh, you saw these installations um, underground and with these large towers, these are so-called super attenuators. And here uh, on the left, you see um, for the low frequency interferometer, we will need uh, cryogenic optics. And this is a, a schematics of the cryostat. So we actually on top, um, we have a super attenuator, which is something here like 12 to 15 meters high. So um, this, um, the payload, uh, the optics here is actually suspended from a five-fold inverted pendulum and you cannot touch it. So around we need of course some thermal shielding and what is more important also uh, even for the vacuum is that you have to separate these long arm pipes uh, from this uh, cryostats and there we will have some what is called cryo traps here. They are in fact cryo pumps which are uh, some 50 meters long on either side of these towers with a diameter of um, one meter. So, and here um, we can rely on the expertise of our colleagues who have actually developed all the cryo pumps for the nuclear fusion uh, community. So in terms of cooling power, you see on this uh, cryo traps, we are in the order um, of uh, a kilowatt um, with temperatures of um, uh, shielding temperature around 80 Kelvin and the low temperatures at 5 Kelvin. So then we need inner shields per tower. They have something, some 100 watt of heat load and the actual payload, um, the optics, um, we are below one watt. So and on the right, you see we have already developed just a conceptual uh, process here with a sub, uh, surf, uh, with on-surface compressor system and then underground installations. So um, I have given the reference here. I'm not going to um, talk about this in detail, but um, you can um, see from here this will a large-scale uh, project where cryogenics and cryovacuum are really key technologies in this experiment. 
Now, um, what concerns this cryogenic payload, um, the um, low frequency interferometer of Einstein telescope is really essential. It operates between 3 and 30 hertz, uh, but in particular below uh, 10 hertz. So this is the only instrument which can access this range. And we have here, compared to Cosmic Explorer or even Kaga, so we have many orders of magnitude sensitivity improvement there. And this will allow us to see uh, larger objects and to look much further back in time. So this is the main point compared to, uh, say, the competitors uh, overseas for the Einstein telescope. Now, how do you cool such a payload, which weighs about one ton, uh, which is suspended uh, on a super attenuator and which you cannot touch? This is really a challenge, sitting in vacuum. So, and here, um, we are not following the cryo cooler option which Kaka is using and which causes many problems, but we are working on a concept actually where we are using superfluid helium-2. And this you can see on the right here. So you see basically the suspension um, of our payload. Um, this is the last platform here, and normally here, so this payload uh, is suspended normally by a titanium wire of five millimeters, in, and instead of this wire, we are using now a double walled capillary tube, just slightly larger, not much. So, and um, here for cool down, um, we are using actually supercritical single phase helium gas flow, where we can through this capillary cool down this payload. And then later on, we convert uh, the helium into a superfluid. Um, and um, so the helium becomes uh, a quantum fluid where most of the particles, they condense into their ground state. At this point, we switch off any flow. The helium is just sitting there and has an enormous uh, heat conductivity better than in any solid. So um, we um, they can then, like this, absorb the heat load uh, from this payload along this way basically without touching the optics. So this is um, very exciting and the most important point here is uh, suspension um, thermal noise, which is um, um, built on a fluctu fluctuation dissipation theory. And um, we are just back from a workshop in Rome last week and here we could show that actually in principle, this concept of such a helium-2 capillary does not violate the sensitivity curve of the Einstein telescope. But there are really new questions which are completely new and no one has answers yet. In fact, so what does the helium-2 do in such a uh, capillary? So basically, it shouldn't interact with the wall because it has zero viscosity, um, but still, gravity is working on the helium, so, and this is a new direction of uh, research which we have to follow in a theoretical but also in an experimental way. Okay, so finally I want to uh, conclude with a nice example of um, knowledge transfer. So some years ago we actually uh, set out to develop a new European standard for uh, the protection of helium cryostats against excessive pressure. So this project was um, also co-funded by the European Amici project and we had uh, six national standardization bodies and uh, uh, partners from industry and um, academia and research centers. So it was Ehrlich Kit, Bilfinger Null, we had CEA, we had uh, CERN involved, Herose, INFN, KIT, Linde Cryotechnik, uh, the PSI, and STFC. So, and um, it was a long process. And what I showed you with these examples is now basically for helium cryostats, it's no way to standardize a solution. So because we have very complex and individual design solutions, but what we did in this um, standard is actually to standardize the way towards a safe design. So and here we were collecting and consolidating the knowledge of many, or say of our experts, there are not many. So in some areas we can count our experts on one hand. So, and, uh, so we were um, collecting and consolidating this in this uh, nice document um, uh, covering starting from risk assessment uh, to uh, protection concepts, finally to the operation also of helium cryostats. And this uh, document is now just published. I got the English version yesterday. So we have the first international standard on, sa on safety of helium cryostats, which is now available to our community. And with this slide, 
I would like to thank you for your attention. Question. I mean, uh, if, you, if you consider your, your potential to save helium and power in the installations, where would you see the most? I mean, you have shown this current lead example. Uh, you have shown the different processes that you can apply with the mixing of the, of the liquids. When would this be, so to say, in a, in a state that Linda or uh, somebody would use it? Because if you, if you right now look in the market, you would not directly yeah. explore this. No, as I say, the current leads in, in, uh, in any application where we have large currents in superconducting magnet, the current leads are the main consumers, and there this technology has a high potential. If you ask me how long it takes, it basically depends on the community here, uh, because they are the customers. and. Um, for now, we have financed this just by internal funding, actually. We have received no funding for this technology, uh, which we are working on now for something like 10 years. We would appreciate a bit more support there. <laughs> there are essentially two big companies delivering cryogenic systems in, in, in the world. Uh, is this any obstacle in order to develop the, uh, the, the systems, the most efficient systems, with the examples which you've shown. On the collaboration, it's absolutely perfect. It cannot be improved. Well, we have to see. I mean, this concept of mixing, actually, it be, uh, the options become less and less as we go to lower temperatures, right? So because um, we, we see for the FCC already there are some we have the um, idea of mixing helium and neon, for instance. So, but the fluid properties are not well known. So, and um, you cannot deduce them from theory. So, uh, we are also working on these equations of state of such mixtures. And this area is not yet completely really exp uh, uh, exploited. So, but say, if you have to go to 4 Kelvin, of course, at the lowest end uh, or below, there is no way away from helium. But still, you have many, say, uh, temperature stages to get there, and there is where the uh, potential improvement is. Um, I don't s I have more questions. I have a question, maybe. Uh, you know, you show uh, two examples of, uh, of the technology. What about uh, low mass uh, cryostat? I mean, uh, where are you? It's not important. Not because uh, you see the, um, the specific heat scales with the Debye law with the temperature to the third power. So actually, when you go to a helium system, there is no heat capacity in the solids. There are orders of magnitude in, in between. So it's, uh, some, it's, uh, the mass is sometimes important during cool down, but not in operation. So. Yeah, I was um, more thinking about, you know, Things like the cryostat in, in, in your detector and uh, you know limiting the, the uh, you, you know the, uh, the material there. No, the, as I say, so the, the, the material is not so much a, a big point. So um, you need, for instance, if you have a pressure, you need some wall thicknesses for the vessels, etc. So we are. Uh, limited by the mechanics there. Mechanics. But, but typically, the magnets and, and the systems they weigh some tons, um, but it's not uh, really a um, bottleneck. Mm. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, the next talk uh, is Frederic Bordry uh, about accelerator technologies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me for that. And I want to thank particularly uh, Carl Jacobs and Maria for this uh, invitation and hospitality. Okay, then today I will speak about this uh, accelerator technologies. Uh, you know the history, uh, successful history of uh, accelerators the last uh, 80 years uh, with a lot of new technology development, saturation, and restart. I want to say that the last, uh, is working? Yes, oh, no, sorry. And last, is, we just spoke about cryogenic superconductivity, main uh, input for superconductivity with magnet and RF. I will use mainly what was already presented in this uh, symposium, the uh, uh, strategy update for energy physics, where we have, 
was noted to have a development of innovative accelerator technology as a driver for science and industry. And the two main points, high field magnet, high temperature superconductors, plasma wake field, and other gradient acceleration. And was followed up by the LDG, the laboratory, laboratory director group, to define the roadmap for uh, accelerator uh, technology development. And once again, all this development around high field superconducting magnet, advanced technology for superconducting and normal conducting radio frequency, and so on. Then I will uh, do my talk mainly uh, on advanced technology on superconducting magnets, uh, superconducting RF. A few words of cryogenics, because I saw just before me was a nice talk about cryogenics, but I will show one, two slides. Also, I think it's important more and more when you go to a, a higher energy and beam intensity, what it is uh, materials uh, and all what it is being intercepting devices and vacuous system. And a small word, a few uh, slides about advanced concepts with this uh, beam driven plasma wake field uh, acceleration and all in 25 minutes. Then fast, fasten uh, your seatbelt, it will be bumpy. <laughs> okay, first of all, uh, superconducting magnets. What I want to say is that uh, uh, the magnet market is not driven by uh, uh, particles uh, or, or the project. It is the main driver for uh, my uh, supercritical magnet is MRI and NMR with a budget close to six, now 6.5 6, billion for MRI, MRI and MR above 1 billion. When we are developing a large supercritical magnet as LHC, where the total cost of 2 billion over four or five years, you can then see that, uh, and uh, ITER was also in the, uh, in the order of 1.5 billion. And this, we have to, to remember that. Now, in terms of materials, we can classify in two types, we call uh, low temperature uh, superconductor and high temperature superconductors, mainly is uh, what it is with the liquid helium and what it is above liquid helium. Then we have our disposal for the for time being, all around niobium titanium, I will come to that, niobium 13, and all these new materials, HTS. In terms of uh, superconducting materials, uh, uh, we have not to mix the order of magnitude. Niobium titanium is now a mature material, uh, as I said, driven by MRI and with a production around 1,000 tons per year. Niobium 13, what it can be above uh, higher uh, field, is mainly driven by NMR and by project as uh, last uh, ITER and now HLLHC, but the production is uh, two order of magnitude lower with 10 tons per year. And you can see with number here that big science projects are large demand for a few years, for five years, and after that we have to wait uh, 10, 15, 20 years before to have the new demand. And for example, with comparison uh, with this uh, 1,000 tons per year, LHG requires in total 1,300 1, tons, which was on peak years, 300 tons per year. And ITER also was in Nabium Titanium and Nabium 13 with a peak production of 250 tons. And now, if you are looking what is a promising material, so all it, it is in HTS, but we are summing all we are in the order of one ton per year. And we have to see the different uh, uh, quantities. And mostly for HTS now is a promising materials, but now fusion is very exciting after the announcement of MIT, but it's 20 Tesla uh, uh, coil uh, in HTS and in power application. Saying that, uh, as I said, Nabium Titanium for accelerator was, is a mature technology, was a lot of development on uh, starting with SSC, uh, you remember that, and uh, every successful ERA, Tevatron, and RIC, and uh, LHG, pushing this uh, technology up to 9 Tesla, 8.3 Tesla working now. I want to see uh, some spin-off, I'm looking Philip over there, and also it was uh, this uh, Isolt uh, solenoid, pushing this uh, also in terms of field, it's a solenoid, it's not a di dipole, but with a successful uh, magnet at 11.7 Tesla, and with a very successful, I, I appreciate because 18 of July is a very important day for me. Uh, okay, then what I will call now HTS is above 9 Tesla. This, uh, the domain of uh, Nabium Titanium is now, as I said, mature, but now what we have to look at is when you want to go above that. 
What we have in terms of conductors is Nibelum Sweetin. People are working for the last 10 years on these uh, conductors. And all the goal is to have a, a critical current more, more or less a 600 amp uh, up, uh, at, at 16 Tesla. And after that, to, to work all this uh, kind of mechanical stress, magnetization, and so on. And in parallel, we're looking at HTS. And people are looking at HTS. They can, they can open also uh, liquid helium uh, above uh, liquid helium. And now, uh, all the performance are pushed by uh, high energy physics, but also uh, set part of all the applications. When you have the conductor, you have to do magnets. And uh, you know that for HLLHE, there is this famous dipole 11 Tesla magnet, what is not so easy. It was some development, and we have to continue uh, with some model and some uh, uh, full length prototype before the mass production. And we discover several problems uh, building magnets, especially at the head and so on, working with this brittle material, Nibram 13. And now they look at, uh, in the next decade after the European strategy, to look at what could be uh, the next 16 Tesla magnet with Nibelium 13, with different uh, shape of a magnet, cosinus theta, blocks, uh, common cores, with all the main institutions, INFN, CMAT, uh, P, um, P, PSI, uh, Swiss, uh, and also with our colleagues CERN and colleagues in, in US. And in parallel, looking uh, at HTS, what we can do with HTS as we insert in the magnet to pass above 16 Tesla and to go to increase from 60 to 20 Tesla. Saying that, uh, uh, when you go to high field magnet, the challenge is, as I said, to increase the uh, critical current, but to sustain a larger force, because all the force has to square of the B field, of the field of the B, and to protect this magnet. And this is a really good, uh, important things. And also, as we discover in LHE, we have to look at to train uh, this magnet faster. When you have one magnet, the state bench is easy, but when you have a hundred of magnets in series, it's starting to be difficult. And how to keep the memory, as you know that LHE is a good test bed to look at that, what to do to, to train faster and to keep the memory. And also to have a global optimization, because magnet is a with the powering, magnet powering, to have uh, with the current leads, we spoke just before, the uh, energy extraction and the power converter. I think this is a very nice graph from the LDG uh, group, is to look at, first of all, uh, how we can demonstrate we can go with Nibium 13 to the ultimate performance uh, towards 16 Tesla, is the first thing. In parallel, to look at with industry how to build this magnet, at the level of 11, 11 Tesla. And based on that, in parallel, as I said, to work with HTS and with uh, when to do uh, uh, this is to increase the field and to increase and to look at how to produce the magnet and to uh, decide for the next uh, strategy what could be the magnet if it is 16, 15, 14 Tesla with Nabel 16 and if the HTS is ready to be for the next machine. Uh, I think I will take this slide to finish my, my, some, uh, on the magnet, what is the revamping of existing beam line magnets. I think this, I, I took that from uh, Lucio Rossi and his uh, PhD student. And I think it's a very good idea to, to look at this large magnet and how you can replace the uh, coil by a super HTS. And I think this could be a very good thing now. We're starting this work. And I, I took some example of large magnet. We have, a, you have a PSI now also at CERN. When you have this, if you can reduce the consumption by a factor 10, that to say, to replacing the coil and keeping the, all the, 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 the structure of the magnet and reducing the, the consumption by a factor 10 will be very successful things. And I think we have to follow that. Okay, I will accelerate with uh, uh, RF cavities. Uh, I think for during uh, a lot of years, it was a quest for the high gradient pushed by ILC. And all these things, you have to reach this uh, 35 megavolt uh, with the Q0 above 10 to 10, was with solid niobium. I think this was good implementation in XFEL in in Germany, with a successful startup in 2017, and with the uh, uh, close to uh, uh, 20 uh, megavolt uh, of all the cavity, uh, a global uh, work for that, and a successful seed, as I said, with 1.3 gigahertz uh, cavity. Also now, 
uh, after this uh, success to go uh, to that, recently uh, new trends. Uh, you heard about this uh, nitrogen doping uh, nublum cavity uh, starting from Fermilab, with also all uh, to, 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 to trap the field and to cool down fast and so on, and different recipe to increase this uh, magnitude of field. And also in parallel, not to use bulk nabium, but to use copper cavity and to have a coating with a thin films. And I will have a slide about cold copper cavity because it's doing a lot of uh, noise nowadays with, with the liquid nitrogen and uh, other uh, around that. Okay, this is a recipe that already in 2014 to have uh, nitrogen doping and increasing the Q0 and uh, keeping the, 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 the gradient. And as I said, with the new things to, to have a fast cooling. And I can say that this, oh, that was too fast. Uh, the first machine using that uh, is uh, HCLS2 machine in, at Slack. I was just coming from Slack now. And I think this was a successful production by Fermilab and G-Lab of this cavity, reaching this 22.2 uh, megavolt and uh, with this uh, nitrogen doping. It will be the first machine with this uh, using nitrogen doping in operation. And last uh, breaking news, now this machine is at 2K from the last week. Uh, it's a very, very nice success to cool down at 4K and 2K. Now, now ready to start RF and to inject electron soon. There is an upgrade of LCLS2, it's called LCLH high energy to double, and this will be also uh, uh, increasing the gradient with the production of the module by G-Lab and Fermilab with also fast, first six, uh, fast cooling. And I think this also is a good improvement with this uh, supercooling cavity uh, bulk nabium. But now we, uh, we can say why not to use uh, nabium on copper or to do have the bulk. And I think this at cryogenic temperature, copper is much better uh, the conductors at an album and uh, more stable. And I think also we can build on the copper without welding with a uh, uh, seamless cavi cavity. And after that, we know how to do now in complex uh, uh, form the uh, coating. This is the last result done at CERN with a uh, uh, thin film uh, technology when you can re really uh, uh, reach this uh, kind of 5, 10 to 10 uh, Q0 and uh, with a high uh, uh, gradient. And I think this is a promising for the future. And uh, this is, I want to show this uh, first test for the uh, FCC EE of this swell, it's called swell cavity, based on that, on the cavity with a uh, uh, film coating. Cold copper cavity was a lot of noise about that because it was a first paper from Slack saying that we can use a copper and to cool down this at nitrogen, what will be a good thing. And looking at the, the curve, you can see we could have a, a, a very good field. And they did a test of 50 centimeter cavity at uh, two, two, two gigahertz, if you remember well, in a uh, uh, quick and dirty test in, in nitrogen, is working very well because they, uh, they reach 130 to almost 150 megavolt per meter. After that, I want to say uh, they produce a paper, said a, a cool route to the X boson and beyond, uh, having that. This I am more skeptical because I think we, when you test only on one module of 50 centimeters, you extrapolate to that to eight kilometers. I think this is a decade of work, but I think I'm not so sure we will be used for uh, uh, X collider, but definitely it's worth to look at if you can do for special application, medical application, I don't know, EIC injector and so on, with this cool copper uh, uh, RF, RF cavity. Uh, 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 Clystron, I think for the decade we are, it was used uh, Clystron with an efficiency now close to 55 to 60 percent. And now there is now improvement work with industry to go from uh, this uh, 60 percent, 55 to 60 percent to 90 percent. And this will be an important uh, step uh, breakthrough for a large machine using this Clystron. 
Also, another thing is pushing the power uh, to replace all the tube, all the tetrod, and with a solid state power amplifier. We're starting with a Soleil uh, in France, uh, starting with a, in a range of, of 40 uh, kilowatt at, uh, uh, in 2005 at 352 megahertz. was followed by several uh, light sources as SLS in Switzerland, uh, the, the light source in Brazil, in Campinas, in the SRF. And la last but not least, the SPS uh, solid state power amplifier, which is a 4 megawatt uh, at, at uh, 200 megahertz. What is this? Is all these uh, 32 towers, what is a major uh, breakthrough in terms of power that. And also in another domain, in higher, not in the 200 megahertz, but 1.3 gigahertz, LCLS2 as solid state amplifier for all the RF system. Okay, cryogenics, I will not go through that. It was a talk, but I just want to remember that uh, what is large power in, in cryogenics for the magnets. Uh, LHE uh, cooled uh, at 1.9 Kelvin, uh, 30,000 tons, with uh, an inventory of 130 tons. This is working with eight independent sectors, uh, with working, uh, improving the availability uh, to 97, 98%, which is impressive because when you have Eight sector, each sector should have an availability above 99.6 percent. This is uh, feasible. We know how to do that. It's a very important result. And uh, we are looking now increasing uh, for HLLG the power uh, of uh, at uh, 4.5 Kelvin will be 280 kilowatt with 52 megawatt electrical consumption. And if you are looking now for the next step, FCC HH, the number are becoming huge because uh, the, the, the cool down will be to, to 230,000 tons to cool down with an inventory close to one megaton of helium and the consumption of 275 megawatts. And I think definitely there is something to look at. We discussed about helium and so on for the beam screen, definitely uh, for and, uh, to, to, to look at that and to look at the different systems to, to cool down, maybe not a magnet, but a beam screen and so on, uh, to reduce this uh, uh, electrical consumption. Just to flash also, based on all these things of cryogenics, uh, about uh, liquid argon for uh, all these uh, new detectors for uh, the neutrino and neutrino platform at CERN work with uh, monophase and dual phase with uh, very high pure things and also with dark side and so on, but I will not have no time. Quickly, for my last 10 minutes, material and beam intercepting device. As I said, uh, now future machine uh, will have higher energy and energy density. We have now to look at and to investigate all the new uh, type of materials and also way to control the beam. And I think it's now the more thing is around graphite, molybdenum carbide graphite, which is a, a new material in development around that. And this development is not only for accelerator, but it's also with industry, fusion energy, uh, uh, um, solar uh, energy about uh, aerospace and so on. And there is a huge collaboration in this uh, molybdenum graphite materials. And I think also we need this facility to test the material. I think this is. A, one slide of Iran Matt, I'm thinking of uh, being in, in, in Spain about if Miss Donetsk that will be built in, uh, in Granada. Uh, I think it's a kind of accelerator high, and, uh, high uh, intensity that we need to test new materials. Okay, this uh, is an important for the future machine, beam intercepting device for different machines for INFG, for neutrino, for neutron, and so on, about target, collimator, and dump. I have no time to, do, to, to, to describe all, but I think this is definitely an important thing. We have to focus not only on RF, uh, on magnet and on uh, RF cavity, but this for me will be a challenge when you have so intense beam at high energy, you will need that to protect you in terms of uh, to produce secondary beam with target, but to protect with collimators and dump. Uh, there is a lot of work now also with ESS, with all this target, but also with a muon collider to look at this target activity with graphite and why not with liquid metal technology and up to use mercury target to be considered with all the risk and so on. But I think there is a boiling collaboration in R&D in this domain. 
Okay, last but not least, uh, advanced uh, collimation with crystal. I think the crystal collimation is definitely something uh, working and can 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 use to uh, for the in collim in collimation system. It is will be used for HL energy and already used for ions. And I think it's a very uh, innovative uh, technology for uh, the collimation. Okay, vacuum system uh, will be fast. Vacuum, this is just a slide I take from CERN, sorry, but defining the different level of uh, vacuum uh, when you have, uh, and with different technology uh, you can have according when you are in 10 minus 8, 10 minus 7 uh, millibar, what you have, when you have the cryo pumping we just discussed before, and when you want to do that. I think the major things I will, I will see the major things it was uh, in the last decade it was uh, the neg non evaporable getter developed initially for LEP and now developed in all the light source on the world and more and more used and I think this is a really a large collaboration around that. Uh, now also in different machines and especially when you have high intensity is all around uh, uh, electron clouds and. Uh, possibility to uh, treat with uh, amorphous carbon in situ or not in situ to remove existing magnet and to, to do this coating. This is, for example, the example done on SPS magnet. Also, uh, this is uh, at KK done on the... Um, uh, 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 I'm missing the name of this KKB uh, 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 machine. And also I know that uh, SNS is doing this kind of coating. This is also at CERN now is looking how to do this coating for the uh, insertion of LHC, how to do for HL LHC. And also we had a problem uh, uh, in LHC that suddenly a difference of heat load of different sectors. By the way, it was also south with more, more heat. Some people say it's normal south, it's warmer than the north. But uh, now we understand what it was. We have a, a um, copper oxide, and we are looking how to, to, to take into account that and to reduce that with a, so, I, 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 either UV gas huh, or cold plasma. And this, I think, cold plasma will be the treatment that will be done during LS3 to uh, cure this problem and the difference of heat loads that could limit the intensity of the beam of HLLG. Okay, more and more complex things in in uh, in uh, 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 machine, especially when you have uh, 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 quenches, uh, large field, for example, for the inner triplet of the HLLG. When you have the, all the system of very close to the experiment, we have a lot of debris should withstand up to 30 tons per mètre and per quadrant. Then a lot of development, of new things are done for this uh, high, high vacuum in high intensity uh, proton machine. I cannot resist to show that all the development done on vacuum uh, for accelerator can be used also for other experiments. This is, uh, was a uh, leak detection for ARIA project made at, at CERN. And also all these uh, new things that looking all this uh, large vacuum for uh, uh, gravitational wave, for example, uh, uh, oh my God, uh, for uh, Einstein telescope, how to use the technology we develop an accelerator to use uh, for this uh, huge, uh, large, uh, 10 kilometer, large things. And I think definitely new collaboration is, is, is put. I just discussed before the talk with uh, Giovanni Lamana, and definitely we have to put these specialists of vacuum together to solve this kind of challenge. Advanced concept, we know that, uh, as I, I demonstrated to you, that now we are, our RF, working RF, we can go cooled copper, we are in the order of 100 megavolt per mètre, maybe 150, but no more. Now with plasma, uh, pe people say, say, said we can go up to uh, uh, gigavolt per meter, saying that we have uh, this accelerator on, on, the, on the sum, but not forgetting you need a big laser or big, uh, uh, accelerator to do that, but definitely there is a way to look at this, how uh, to produce a micro nano accelerator with a tera -S laser or a plasma accelerator. And we, of course, oh, I want to, to mention this uh, Epraxa, what it is a very important uh, project placed now on the S3 roadmap and it will start. And I think it could be a good seed for the future. 
Okay, I will, I will do my, my conclusion. Sorry to be so fast. I think uh, uh, I, I, I forgot to speak. I did not time to, 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 to speak about other technology. And uh, as I mentioned, cry cryogenics, uh, nelium, or other things, magnetic arm, beam instrumentation, beam dump system, quench protection, power converter, and modulator for RF, and so on, and so on, and so on. I want to say that the multiple AC energy uh, exists, and I think it's a good thing to have this kind of symposium with uh, GENAS, with nuclear physics and astrophysics. We have the same kind of technology, we can work to together. I think we have also the same technology at uh, ITER. We have collaboration with ITER in the domain of RF, superconductor, power converters, materials, and so on. Energy, the domain uh, larger, manufacturing technique. I, did, I didn't spoke about 3D uh, printing, uh, space application, and so on. And I think for me, uh, global cooperation on future accelerator will lead uh, to technological breakthrough as, as we saw in the past and new concepts. I want to finish and to give an introduction to Mar after that. Uh, uh, we had uh, from 2010, uh, we were three organizations. Uh, I was pushing at uh, when I was at CERN, CERN, ESS, and ERF with uh, uh, energy uh, at research infrastructure to have a workshop and to put together the different research infrastructure to look at how we do energy management, to have concrete examples of energy efficiency, energy recovery, energy quality, and to see what we are developing in our labs we can use in the future. Then we had this uh, series of workshops uh, starting in uh, 2011 uh, in Lund, after that at CERN, DAISY, at Bucharest, uh, and the uh, last one was at, at Willingen. And I think for me it's important, and I think I'm convinced that we will not have a large science project without a special dedicated chapter on energy management and material use in the future. It will be mandatory. And I think it's important to be, to be ready to that and to take that in the development. I mentioned cryogenics, I mentioned also for things. We have to take energy consumption, energy recovery from the design. And I want to finish to say we will organize um, the committee. The six, number six, will be in Grenoble in end of September. And I can, I, you have the link. Come, I think it's very important to have everybody together to, to have a reflection about this energy for sustainable science at Research Infrastructure. Thank you very much for your attention. What a tour de force, unbelievable, <laughs> 60 slides in 30 minutes. So, questions? Dead. <laughs> Maybe one. I mean, if uh, we see what, what will hamper our future developments, I, I think you made the point that helium availability, energy uh, consumption will be, so to say, a, a limiting factor in developments for the, for the new installations. Uh, I, I, I agree. Uh, helium, for me, is a very important thing. I, when I'm, I fight every time when I was director at CERN to say, Helium, you have to, we have to keep molecule of helium. We have, not, we have to do all our best not to use, to recycle and so on. To, it's time to time difficult. For large, LHC, at the end, we were 130 tons. It was less than 10 tons of consumption per year. In the small experiments, it's more difficult because you have, you have to have a conscious that molecule of helium is very rare and crucial. In terms of energy, I agree with you, we have to work, and I think by my slide, about energy efficiency. We have, we look at also in the cryogenics of LHC to do heat recovery, and now we have project, it will start, and maybe Mar will spoke about that. Uh, 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 recovery of energy, uh, heat, uh, water from a compressor in the point eight, and now sent to a new district in Ferne Voltaire that we will use for heating and cooling of the, of the uh, buildings. And I think this we can increase for LHC, but the next accelerator we have to, to build from the beginning, and we have to, to be embedded, it should be part of the, of, of the design of the project. Uh, the, despite those 60 slides, there, there are still some parts which uh, were missing. Of course. Uh, <laughs> so you, you, yeah, I, my, my I would like to underline, I think, important part which was missing. Uh, the, these are high power accelerators which are used for ADS, uh, CW machines, uh, and also for heavy ions. So there are beautiful developments and uh, 
I would say not going always in this uh, direction uh, because there are specific machines, especially, especially for heavy ions. Uh, so also on cavities on everything what you said, but uh, they, they, I think it's worth to, to mention, especially that four days ago a completely new machine, a superconducting clinic at uh, Michigan State University was uh, inaugurated in the US. Uh, I, I think th this is very important, the pilot development with much higher powers, for example, for CW machines. I fully support what you're saying. I'm fully supporting because also now I'm, I'm part of the small startup working in EDS, uh, looking at the transmutation of the nuclear waste. And definitely this is a domain we have to investigate. Higher power uh, high accelerator for all these applications, EDS and so on. Yes. Thank you for the comment. Yeah, thank you for your very smooth TGV ride. Uh, I had a very naive question. So when in, my, in our younger days, we switched from copper to niobium full. And now, if I got you right, you're saying you took uh, copper and plated it with niobium now. So what is the reason for this uh, change? I'm sorry about the silly question. No, no, I, I think it's not a silly question. I think there's a lot of progress about uh, uh, coating in, in terms of production and so on, because I remember uh, Maria just left, but we had, we, we, we built a RF cavity for isolated, uh, oh, sorry, isolated, uh, isolated, I'm thinking to you, uh, isolated uh, with a, a RF cavity was in copper in, in, in after thin tin, in a thin film, uh, niobium. It was difficult. We learned, we spent days, uh, we spent, uh, weeks, uh, years to do that, and we successful. And this is a success, and what's the difference? Is a, is a step. And now that we know how to do in the complex forms of RF cavity, how to do a good coating with a good control of the surface and so on, I think now we can go again to that. But this is part of technology, it's jump to one technology and so on. It's true, pushing, pushed by, I saw that, ILC and all these machines about uh, ESS, LC, LS2 and so on, we have now success with a bulk, but now it's time to look at this uh, copper with uh, niobium thin film. Yes, I think due to the, also uh, the, uh, seamless, now 3D printing, maybe we can think 3D printing of copper and thin film. There's moving things. Any more question? Uh, maybe I have a quick one. Uh, uh, niobium availability and quality of niobium. I mean, I was in a, recently on a, review panel where, uh, you know, the niobium arrived, but it was not at the quality that was uh, uh, expected and the Q values then could be problematic. Uh, what is your feeling? Are we having problem in the supplies or? I did not uh, uh, heard about that. I was, as I said, I spent five months uh, at Slack, uh, Stanford, uh, <laughs> just before to come here. And uh, now they are produce, finishing production for this uh, new uh, cavity, G-Lab and Fermilab for LCLSHE. Yeah. I did not learn yeah. about this, this, no, I think okay. this, uh, I know. Okay. Now, now the, the main thing is the nitrogen doping, what is working well. Now the thing, so with the time, uh, it will be nice to have LCLS2 operation and to look at with time and so on, with uh, warming up, cool down, how it will be. And also all this ID is the same thing that for magnet, when you train a magnet alone, when we have a chain, a string of magnet, we will do the same thing also when you have to cool down fast one module and we have to cool down 100 module in series. No, but I was wondering because also no, no. the niobium was coming from, uh, from China to a French from Brazil, company. From, Bra from Brazil. Uh, yeah. Anyhow, uh, thank okay. you. Thank you. So last talk of the session, Mark Pans, about uh, uh, how to limit the impact uh, on the environment of our technology. Very important. Thank you, Mark, for thank talking you, about Thank you, thank you very that. much. And in fact, I wanted to start saying that, um, you know, it's a bit strange to me to be here today, today talking about this because I've been always a passionate about the environment because probably, you know, I grew up in the north of Spain where there are incredible forests and sea landscapes, and this is part of my personality. But also because I'm convinced that uh, whatever and, and whatever is the role in, a, in the organizations where we work, we can always give an impact. And I've been a particle physicist almost for three decades, but I find myself uh, today, since one year, uh, leading the site and civil engineering department of CERN. These, these things happen. And uh, this department is, uh, I would say, often the 
implementator of some of the measures and the proactive way that CERN has to take, CERN has to um, take care of the environment. So um, it's for me a pleasure to be talking about this. So let me just check if this works. Yes. So I, I, I've been talking to you about four little things, which is the environmental protection at CERN, uh, how we report about the environment and the impact on, on environment, about how we plan to develop the site and what are the constraints on that development and the future. And many of the information you will hear today is compiled in two public documents uh, that have been released at the end of 2021, which is the environmental reports of CERN and the CERN Master Plan, and you have the links uh, in, in this slide. So I don't think I have to explain uh, at the end of the conference what CERN is, but uh, I wanted to give you a couple of, uh, of data which are relevant to understand the numbers you will see later. And first of all is, uh, you know, uh, CERN is a very large organization with this very powerful uh, accelerator complex delivering physics. And there is a kind of permanent population of CERN, which are the permanent employees, about 3,600. But then we have this very large population of users that come, and they are the, the drivers of the scientific program that come to the organization. And they vary between uh, 6,000 and at the peak, uh, about 12,000 on site. So this floating population obviously affects the, the impact of CERN in the environment. And uh, also something which is very specific to CERN, which is the cyclic way we have to operate our machines to do science, which is basically we run for about four years the accelerators and then we stop for two or three years to upgrade the facilities. This doesn't mean that the physics is a stop, on the contrary, but the, the mode of operation of CERN and the impact on the environment changes because of that. I also wanted to show you um, some numbers which are quite uh, impactful in my view, which is uh, we often say that CERN looks like a city, and it did, indeed it, it does. We have two main sites, about 670 buildings, and uh, I think the, the not so nice thing is that 60% of those have been built below the 70s, so the, the infrastructure is very, very depreciated today. 70 kilometers of tunnels, caverns, roads, 1,000 kilometers of technical galleries with fibers and tubes and all what you can imagine. We receive at the peak 9,000 persons daily at CERN, and this means a lot of commuting. We have about 500 hostel rooms. In fact, uh, many people doesn't know, but we are the biggest hotel in the Geneva area. Uh, 4,300 parking places, 1,400 parking places in France. And anyone that has come to CERN, always you have had problems to park. So you see that we really use them. This means that at least we have 5,000 cars moving on the site every day and 25,000 movements between people coming to CERN to work and commuting between the different sites of the LAC. So it is indeed a kind of small city. So the strategy uh, to limit the impact of the organization on the environment, um, I think uh, what is very interesting here is that I believe that the tone of an organization is set often by the top management. And this, we have the lack at CERN that uh, Environment has been included as one of the main objectives of the organization for years 21 and 25. What does it mean? It means that environment is considered as part of the, or crucial to the mission of the organization and the future of the organization. So there is a strong direction which is set by the DG, endorsed by the management and council, but also an enthusiastic follow-up of the people that works at CERN. And also something very relevant is that there is an increased accountability and governance with uh, several positions that have been specifically appointed to follow and to give impulse to these efforts. Also very important, this generating transparent and reliable reporting with materiality assessment that I will show you and uh, being very clear on reporting the greenhouse gas emissions and the targets following the world uh, standards. And then most important of it, acting, which is setting targets where do we want to be at a given point in time, but also may, being very aware that this global strategy has to be converted into local actions, 
that then they are translated into operational objectives which are accounted in the departments for execution. And, and this is very important when this strategy appears. So I don't go into the details, but you see that these efforts on environment, they date from long at CERN. I would say that one of the most clear examples was the creation of this energy management panel by uh, uh, Frederic Baudry that just uh, mentioned many of these aspects on energy and I think got already the difficult questions. But you see that along the years there has been a number of things either on reporting or appointing people for specific things, setting targets, making strategic documents. So I think there is a rich history of actions saying that CERN has always put the environment as a fundamental part. And when one starts to report on environment, the, the, the standard in the world today is to produce this materiality, materiality analysis. And uh, basically, what this means is that you take the internal and, state, and external stakeholders, you put them together, and you check what is important for all these people. And it gives this kind of matrix that says what is really important for the both, for the people, the scientific program at CERN, but also for the host states, for the people that live around CERN. And you see on the top right what are the key topics that arrive in common. And the, out of these topics, CERN has taken or selected three most important priorities, which is energy consumption, the greenhouse gas emissions, and water. And I will explain you a little bit about this. Um, I suppose that many of you are aware of these definitions. I just wanted to tell you a little bit how the world of environment and climate change talks about, which is this is scope one, two, and three. For all of you that know, that's fine. For the ones that you don't know, I think it's important just to remind a couple of things because you will see in the next slides Scope 1 emissions are basically the emissions that you own. I mean, that are the control resources in an organization. So for CERN, are the emissions because we are running accelerators to do physics. They are the emissions because we have a professional car fleet. And there are emissions because we have to heat the buildings. Then there is the scope 2, which is the emissions generated because we purchase electricity. And then the scope 3, which is any activity downstream or upstream, which is needed to run this business, basically. And they are very difficult to calculate because it, it, you don't control them. But at CERN and in all the other companies and organizations in the world, they are the ones that contribute most to your emissions. So this is a big topic today. So let me continue. And I just flashed the type of reporting that CERN is producing today where you see that there is these clear priorities on energy, on water, and also on the, the, the emissions, the T CO2 emissions. The numbers are there. And I think what is important to tell you is that these numbers are from 2018. Of course, we have the numbers after. But I show you these values because the targets we have set at with respect to 2018. So these values are important. And I think what is even more, more important is that CERN has committed to have clear reduction targets, which is 28% reduction on the greenhouse emissions, limit the rate of energy, of energy consumption by 5%, and you, I will explain you why this, and limit the rate of water consumption, and not only of the consumption, but also on the purity or the quality of the water by 5%. And then there is a number of engagements that is a bit difficult for the time being to put targets, but CERN is committed to increase the recycling uh, rate of waste, to restrict the noise, to keep constant commuting, and to protect the biodiversity. And it, they, they do not look very ambitious, but they are because CERN continues to be a growing community. The machines we are building are very demanding in terms of energy but also in terms of cooling. So by trying to do better physics, trying not to increase proportionally the energy or the water that we need is already a quite ambitious target. So let me just give you a few hints about emissions. These are the direct emissions. And what you see in the plot is for the years 2017 to 2020, 
the emissions from this scope one, so the direct emissions of CERN, and the emissions from the scope two, so due to the energy. And you see already here some interesting data, which is, first of all, this, this cyclic, cyc cycling period of CERN, where in 2019 and 2020, the machines were stopped, so we use less energy. And nonetheless, that the energy is not the biggest uh, contributor to the emissions because the energy at CERN it comes from France and is delivered by nuclear plants. So in terms of CO2 equivalent, it's a quite favorable situation. Where we do a bit worse is on the direct emissions uh, to atmosphere, and this is basically driven by the experiments. 98% of these emissions are uh, due to the pure core activity of CERN and is related to the use of fluorinated gases in the particle detectors or um, uh, fluorinated liquids on the cooling of the detectors. And we have clear measures there to reduce both numbers and this will be specifically very visible when we will um, upgrade the machine and start on the high lumi phase of, uh, of CERN. Something very important is the energy consumption, and uh, today even more, not only because of the emissions, but of the cost. And here you, say the you see the track of this energy consumption between 2010 and 2021, and you see exactly once more while, while we are on shutdown that the energy comes down. And I think here the important information is to say that 90, well, while we are operating, when the accelerators are running, 90% of the energy is because we need to run the accelerators and the campus, just having life at CERN is only 10%. And when we are stopped with the accelerators, I think the ratio is more about a 60-40, okay? So it's extremely important to work on, on, on this aspect. And let me show you the actions that we are doing on this energy consumption. First of all, there is a continuous target to, to, to increase the efficiency by saving how we use that energy. And then you see this interesting plot at the bottom, which is, um, I would say, a very specific KPI, key performance indicator for CERN, which is the energy you need to fuel the LAC to produce luminosity. And, and what is very interesting is to say, our target at CERN, obviously, is to produce luminosity. Luminosity for us is basically the amount of collisions that the LEC accelerator delivers. And the bigger the luminosity is, the bigger amount of data you produce, the bigger precision you have on physics, and the bigger potential of discovery is there. And that's why, for us, this is a very, very relevant magnitude. And you see that almost by keeping constant the energy, we managed to double the luminosity during, during run two, and we will put a factor 10 on the luminosity in the high lumi phase by almost keeping constant the amount of energy you have to deliver to run the machine. So it is needed still to increase the, the consumption of energy, but not proportionally to the luminosity that the accelerator delivers. Of course, another strategy is to use less. Uh, Frédéric Baudry already mentioned this effort on the east area where the power converters have been completely refurbished and the, the impact is enormous, uh, basically results on a 90% reduction of electricity. So these initiatives are really outstanding. I will show you a bit later what we are trying to do with the campus, what we want to do to uh, reduce the consumption on the campus. Something which is also very interesting is to send to the experiments and the users a virtual bill so they become aware of the energy they use. And then something which is also very important, we are engaged from this year to do an energy performance plan and become compliant with ISO 50001 standard, which means that there will be a kind of continuous improvement efforts to make sure that we use less energy at CERN. And the third pillar is to recover and we need a lot of energy, so we have the potentiality to recover a lot of that energy. Frederic already mentioned this um, project, which is already a reality, which is taking the hot water from one of the LEC cooling systems, which is in the LEC B experiment, and it will heat up a residential area. So this has been completed, and we are continuing with two projects. The first one is constructing a new computing center on the Prevesan site of CERN, 
and recovering the energy of that computing center to heat all the Prevesan sites. So this is in the making, the proposal. And the second one is to use the same concept as it has been used to heat that little residential area, which is to pick the residual heat at point one in the Atlas experiment and have the potentiality to heat most of the Meran site in the year 2026. So these are efforts that are going. Let me show you these indirect emissions, which is for the moment a very draft data. But as I said at the beginning, these indirect emissions, the scope three, which is anything related to upstream and downstream of your activities, are very important because they are huge contributors to this emission. And at CERN, even if we measure and we do a lot of efforts on waste, on food, on water, on commuting, at the end, most of our emissions come from procurement. So, and this has been identified and uh, there is now, starting from this year, a new uh, initiative that will bring incredible changes on the way we procure um, goods at CERN. Just to give you an impression, um, if you would make a kind of rating of where do we meet the most, at CERN is on mechanical engineering and raw material for mechanical engineering. Civil engineering would be the next category. The third one will be electric components, then followed by electronics and then by IT. So we have to do efforts in all these areas. And this strategy, which is now put in, is being put in place, will have major impact for CERN. And I will explain you why. First of all, we will have to think why we are buying. Do we need to buy? Do we need to, um, you know, um, do collaborations uh, with external partners to produce some of the components, then be very aware of what do we buy? Uh, what are polluting materials there? Can we recycle of them or, or not? And then very important from where we buy. And this at CERN brings additional complexity because being an international organization, which is paid by the member states, we have this embedded policy of a fair return to our member states. And it might well be that there are conflicting arguments between being sustainable when we buy and trying to give a return to the countries that contribute to pay CERN. So all this is in the making, and you will hear about this more towards the end of this year. So I wanted to quickly show you a couple of points on, on, on the CERN master plan. And I know that you are not interested to know how many buildings and how we will build or renovate on the CERN site. But I think what is important is to understand that having a very concrete strategy of how you want to develop the site is an incredibly efficient tool to be aware and to fight against the impact on the environment. So, we had a plan at CERN that was elaborated in 2015, and we have now updated this plan because we are getting close to this end of the dec decade of 2030. And what is new in this new master plan is not only that we describe what the CERN land or how the CERN land will need to be used if we follow the European strategy for particle physics, whatever form it will take, but because we also have included sustainability on how we want to develop the site, and this sustainability comes with opportunities, but also with many constraints. So very quickly, I wanted to show you that this master plan that talks about land basically is based on four pillars, which is environment, landscape, mobility, and urbanism. So I pass really very quickly. I mean, when we talk about environment, we are talking about managing the resources we have on the site, the biodiversity, the pollution. So two concrete examples, water. Water, as you saw at the beginning in the material, materiality analysis, is one of the biggest concerns from our host countries. And you see the plot of the water consumption at CERN, where there has been a continuous effort to improve not only reduce the amount of water we use, but also to control the purity of the water we send to the water courses around CERN. And there, the strategy is quite simple, is uh, trying to go to closed loop circuits, trying to cancel cooling towers, but also, for instance, building on site what we call these rotation basins, which basically keeps the water on site, you analyze it, and you treat it before it goes back to the Geneva Lake. So this is part of the strategy. And noise, 
Just to give you an indication, what we have done is a very detailed mapping of all the noise which is generated by the campus, but in particular by the technical infrastructures. And we have set very clear targets, which is never go beyond 60 decibels during day, 70 decibels during night, which is basically the level of a conversation. And whenever we have to go beyond this, we have to mitigate, or we have to build this, what we call a, a, a tampon zone, where there is no human activities around. So this is part of the strategy. If I look more at the part of urbanism in this master plan, you see here an example of the efforts, which is, you saw, I said at the beginning that we have this very old building. So the idea is we cannot afford to basically renovate all these buildings. So the idea is let's have a combination of new buildings with consolidation of infrastructures that are worth keeping, but also demolishing the ones that are really not economically viable anymore. So this is part of the part of the strategy. If I go on, uh, here I, it's just an, an example of this uh, Prevesan Computing Center and, and, and the, the specifications. I don't think it's worth uh, to mention it uh, here, otherwise I don't reach the end. I think maybe something which is relevant because it also applies to many other organizations is how to plan the consolidation of a site, in particular at CERN with 600 buildings. It's clear that the priorities for this consolidation plan is for us safety. The second one is the strategic value of the buildings with respect to the scientific goals of the organization. But also we have included now sustainability, which means durability, environmental impact and energy performance of the building. So all what we are doing now, and you see here a plot that shows you the state of the buildings at CERN with respect to some standards in civil engineering. And well, it looks quite okay, you know, 50% of the buildings at CERN are in good state, about 40% are in medium state, and 10% are in very bad state. And 10% is not so much, but 10% at CERN means 60 buildings. And if you think that renovating a building costs between 3 and 11 millions, we basically cannot really afford this. So we have to make sure that whenever we take the decision to renovate the building, we do it well, and that the building will stay in good conditions for the next 50 years. And if I talk 50 years in the future, there is no chance and we have to really consider energy efficiency improvements, the monitoring and uh, making sure that we favor centralized networks, that we are very, very aware of what would be the environmental conditions of the world in 50 years. So this is an important thing. Mobility, very important. I just wanted to give you a couple of examples. Mobility is always a very, very difficult topic, especially because I told you that we have about 6,000 cars every day at CERN and everyone wants to come and park on their building. So we, uh, for the first time, I think we have done a, a, a strategy for mobility that uh, includes many, many aspects. And I think what is important in that strategy is that it's data-driven. So we have spent a lot of time trying to understand how the people come at CERN, how many people is on site. And uh, we managed to uh, define targets, set key performance indicators for the actions we want to have. And I just list there the easy ones where we have started, like increasing the number of electrical bikes. And it does sound like a very easy thing to do, but it has been impressive to see the impact on just having 80 electrical bikes at CERN because we have seen that the people now come by public transport because they know they have at the door, when they are in CERN, an electrical bike. So a little, little thing has an enormous impact on the culture of the people. So the, it's quite interesting to see these things. I think I will skip this one and go also to other aspects, which is technology and environment. So something which is also very relevant is to engage everyone at CERN on, 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 on all these measures. And uh, I mentioned here two initiatives. The first one is something that has been launched. Well, two of them are launched now in early 2022, which is an innovation program on environmental applications. Basically, you know this very well, from CERN to society is let's encourage the people that is working in all these breakthrough technologies to sometimes think a little bit beyond and see if these technologies we have at CERN can be used in society and have an impact on the environment. So this has been launched uh, 
few weeks ago. And then we have another interesting initiative that is called Green Village that we are setting up. That's why for the moment it's not so advertised, which goes the other way around, which is from society to CERN and back to society. And the idea is to enable to companies, consortiums, colleagues, to a rapid access to the CERN site to test their innovation and this will accelerate how this innovation can be brought back to society. So basically, uh, any company that is working on challenges like waste management, mobility, energy, and so on, we will set up a framework that they can come to CERN because it is a little city, test their thing, and bring it back. So you will hear about this in the next uh, months. Oops. And then last, how we include all these environmental impacts in, in the future projects. I think Frederic already mentioned some of the aspects. And I would say, just to give you an example of the very long future with FCC and CLIC. For FCC, the strategy is, is very, very embedded in the way this machine is being designed. Um, and I think what, what is quite interesting is that it touches all possible aspects from scientific excellence to territorial compatibility to the aspects for implementation and operation of the facility with a quite simple policy, avoid, reduce, and compensate, which is exactly the policy of the host states. They have spelled out this type of uh, strategy, and it includes geology, urbanism, societal health, technical development, so all the possible aspects, and not only. It's not only that we will work on reducing but we will also engage and give back to society whatever it can be given back, like sharing waste heat, sharing technical infrastructures. So this is one of the approach. And the second approach, which has been taken by CLIC uh, already since many years, is to basically try to use the minimal amount of resources to deliver the target energy and luminosity of this accelerator working on the overall system design, on the components, and on the sustainability of the operation. So this basically brings me, do I have? Uh, I'm over, <laughs> I'm over. So I skip the ambitions because I have mentioned them over the talk. And I, I will just give you the outlook. I mean, CERN's strategy with respect to environment and sustainability is based on three lines of action, which is reduce the impact. And this means really monitoring, reporting, and reducing the CO2 footprint evaluation, uh, reduce the energy consumption, this is key today, and developing technologies that can help society. So the, the actions to reduce the, the environmental impact usually require long planning, uh, they, they take time, the return of investment is also long, but it's also true that if you don't start, it will be very difficult to just have global strategy. So the message is, let's start with little projects like you saw with this uh, recovering the heat for, to heat Prevesan or Meran, and, and this will grow later. And then you see at the bottom two sentences, which are basically a copy-paste of the sentences that Frederic used to close this topic, because I think Frederic has been a pioneer on the field of engineering. And, uh, and of energy for this large infrastructure. So I would say that from the CERN side, we have some limitations because it is an old infrastructure and we have to be creative to now try to embed in our strategy all these environmental aspects. I think for new infrastructures, it will be easier. And, and, and I think in a non-formal way, I would say if someone is planning to really build a big infrastructure, they should plan it where renewable energies are readily available and uh, also always keep clearly in mind that uh, in the design of the new infrastructure one has to put sustainability and energy at the same level than the efficiency or scientific efficiency of, of the machine and, uh, and I don't think we have another choice today. So thank you very much. very much. This is a very important discussion that we have to have in our field. Uh, questions, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for a very nice talk for our future of our Earth. Uh, I had two questions. So the first one was about slide 15, was about this procurement. Yes. So 
so did I understand correctly? Because as you said, the member states give back in-kind uh, contributions. So many things are done far away from CERN. So will this have an impact on the uh, partners like this? Yes. This is one of the things we are preparing because um, it is complex, it is complicated. On one hand, CERN is committed to maximize the return to the member states and we monitor very closely these indicators. And now we have to add to that type of commitment to make sure that whatever we buy and wherever we buy, it minimizes the impact. So the straightforward solution would be to uh, procure very local, but this doesn't work for us. So we have to now embed this second factor on this procurement strategy and it's exactly what we are working on to make sure that we don't harm you know, this policy of return to the member states. So we will probably have to, within the member states, favor relationships with the industry that have already embedded the sustainability commitments. So it doesn't mean that we will reduce the return but we will have to be more selective with which companies we work on the member states. I had another, just a little question. What is the cost of this, roughly? I know. The cost of? Of the whole plan. For example, it's shown till 2030. So yes. What yes. Is the rough so the cost is very difficult to calculate, but uh, the CERN budget has today about, remember the CERN budget is about 1,200 millions per year. And there is an allocation of about 30, mil 30 millions over 10 years uh, for the program that globally looks at environment. Okay, this means the program that will set targets for biodiversity, for technology transfer, for uh, energy. But then, if I think of other contributions, for instance, if I look at the consolidation budget of CERN, which is about 15 million per year to consolidate the site, all aspects, about 20% of that budget goes directly into um, actions to reduce the impact on the environment. So it is very difficult to give a global figure because it's very scattered, but it's, um, I would say, on the order of hundreds Thank you, Mar, for <clears throat> this very interesting talk. I have a personal curiosity is how do you calculate the numbers, for example, emission or uh, that you presented is done by an external independent companies or yes. you have a team? And what is the cost of monitoring that? Not, not the global cost, but just the cost of monitor monitoring all these uh, numbers. Thank you. Yes. So, again, it depends very much. So, all the reporting follows these global reporting indicators, which is a global standard, which is now used by all companies. And uh, the reporting and the way of calculate is done by external uh, expert. Then the cost of monitor, once again, is very scattered. So, we monitor by default and, and well before we started reporting on it, for instance, on the emissions from the particle detectors. We have a very easy way to report through, you know, the gases, through mass flow controllers, and we know very well how much we recuperate and how much we throw to atmosphere. But this is not counted like a cost to monitor the environmental impact. And the same happens with energy. I mean, we are monitoring constantly the, the way and where we spend the energy, but this is embedded in the network uh, instrumentation. So we don't, we don't count it like that. I don't see any more questions. Uh, Thank you very much. Well, Thanks. Uh, maybe I have one uh, of course. about the travel. I mean, our yes. community really benefits from traveling and meeting in person. Uh, we have uh, uh, seen articles on nature saying that uh, uh, zoom all, zooming all the time uh, uh, sort of uh, doesn't improve, uh, you know, the creation of a uh, uh, novel idea. So. But we have also pressure from our universities, for example, to reduce travel, to yes. become net zero. How do you see that developing for our community? Uh, it, it is difficult. I think um, th there are two components to that. And I have to say that also at CERN, now we have um, a reduction on the traveling uh, with a clear target, reducing 30% of uh, how much we travel. And we know the consequences of that. So. Uh, even if we would have a target on 30%, this doesn't mean that you ac apply the same to every person in the organization. There are activities that need more traveling than others.
So I think we will all have to make efforts to travel less if we really want to reduce the emissions we generate. We have no choice. I know that is not is nice to meet in person, but we don't have a choice unless you go by train or by bike. <laughs> We don't have a choice. So there is going to be a lot of pressure. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so we are at the end of the Jena Symposium, of the second Jena Symposium, and it is my pleasure first to thank all the contributors. I think we had a very broad program. We have touched a lot of topics, of synergetic topics, but also, of course, of specific topics, scientifically, and also, also overarching things. So it is my pleasure to thank that all of you and also the people who already left, uh, that you followed the invitations and the discussions and uh, made this conference, this symposium, I think, to a real success. And it was very interesting to follow all these talks and to discuss with all these topics with the uh, three communities. So thank you very much. So that, that, that's you know that the success of a conference is uh, uh, on, on important with several factors or s uh, several ingredients. Uh, of course, the scientific uh, program, th this is the, the major part. Uh, interactive participation uh, of the audience, I think it's, uh, it's very important. Asking questions, answering the questions and uh, to have lively discussions during the coffee breaks uh, and, and dinner, beautiful. Uh, dinner, but uh, of course, uh, every conference depends very much on the local organization and local organizers. Uh, of course, you see where I'm going. Uh, so please give the warm and very loudly uh, applause to Maria and her team. And uh, okay, now we need to start thinking about the future and uh, the workshop has been su very successful and we already got some questions, when is the next one? Um, so, uh, of, uh, our, um, the original pr um, plan for this GINA seminar was uh, that it would happen every two years. In this time, we had uh, three years in between, so uh, okay, we need to uh, still discuss if uh, it's better two or three years. Um, and typically, uh, the organization we will start maybe uh, about, uh, okay, you will know, uh, we will discuss about uh, how, uh, when, when is the next one uh, to be organized. Um, and we will, uh, of course, ask for uh, ho um, interesting hosting this new event. In terms of the format, I think we got uh, positive feedback on, on what uh, has been happening here. And uh, also from the funding agency's point of view on some specific topics we need to improve for the next time. So we will also be working on that. So yeah, hopefully in two years or three years from now, we will see each other again. Thank you. Last words. No. <laughs> for me, the thanking is to you. Uh, you know how difficult it has been to, to organize because of COVID that entered in the plane as a new plane and projection. But you have made it possible by your coming here and interacting, as it was said. Eh? And I think that's the main reward of these genus. The subjects we have been discussing here are a bit um, transversal to the ones we are used to, but they are very necessary. 
So, I mean, this conference is two years and a half after the other one, maybe two years and a half is a good compromise uh, for the next one. The, the subjects, more less scientific subjects that has been discussed here are important and they have not been solved. So we have a lot of work to be done. Eh? And with that, I would like just to wish you a nice uh, trip back home and keep you healthy. So thank you very much for your support for coming.